Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman. Ah, sorry, mouthful of bugs. Oh no, they're laced with capsaicin. Now my voice is going to be screwed up for the whole podcast. Sorry everybody. Anyway, I'm here with uh, my co-host, Scott Daly. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Matt. Sorry. Sorry about all the bugs. Uh, I, I, I find it helps when you uh, close your mouth, especially oh. when you're like flying through the air. I like was that. trying to lure the bugs in my mouth. Oh, though. OK. Yeah. Okay. I didn't mention that earlier. Ah, ah. That makes a logical, a logical sense, even though some people say it doesn't. Anyway, oh. uh, <laughs> as you said on this podcast, this is the podcast. Wow, I can't talk. It's been a long time since I did this. I don't don't know if I remember how to podcast, Matt. I think we'll figure it out. All right. This is the podcast where you, a worm expert, guides me, a first-time reader, through Wild Bo's world of superheroes, supervillains, and everything in between as I inspect, interpret, and even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week, we are covering Arc 22 Cell. And Matt, this is, uh, this is a big one. They've all been big ones, technically. But this yeah. is... Uh, this is some crazy things happen. Some very unexpected things happen. It's it's a hell of a ride. Yeah, it, it this it, I think the, the arc twenty two, like pretty much arc twenty through arc twenty two, all have these amazing gut punch moments in them. Um, and and this is certainly one that I know people were excited about you getting to. I, I could say the same about the last several arcs, though. So that's yeah, uh, it, it is funny yeah. that like every one, it's like I think I finished off each of the episodes of the last few saying. And this changes everything <laughs> and <laughs> it just keeps everything keeps changing everything. Uh, Taylor was outed. That changes everything. Taylor surrenders. That changes everything. And then we finish with our 22 where Taylor uh, literally stops being Skitter, which does change everything. Yeah. Yeah. And yet it all feels very organic. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's absolutely. Going from thing, thing to thing. It's 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 a logical progression. I completely agree. I, I, I really did enjoy this. I still think. 21 or, or 20 is my reigning champion for best in the book series so far but this was i think right up there yeah yeah i think there's definitely a case to be made there all right um so so in terms of announcements this week uh this is another weird week for us uh, this time it, it's my fault though we're gonna be recording uh this episode at the normal time relative to when you hear it but we're going to be recording Arc 23 almost immediately after this, and uh, that means you're not going to be hearing it till much much later than we recorded, and, and we won't be, be able to address any comments for that episode. So sorry about that, but our schedule will return to normal soon after. Yeah, and that also probably means that just for time's sake, I will not be doing a live read of Arc 23. Um, it's just not feasible. We have to fit the stuff in. Like it's going to be really tight our schedule. Um, I obviously haven't read it when we're recording this, so literally I'm going to stop recording this and start reading right away um, to make sure I don't fall behind enough to where I'm not prepared for that podcast when we record it. So we apologize for that. We'll be back to, to normal soon. Um, it just yeah. happens. It happens. Yeah, I've, I've already started my synopsis for our next episode, which I've never actually had to do before. So oh, wow. that's how tight things are. Yeah, wow. All right, so this week's questions and comments. Um, first of all, uh, Wild Bo stopped by and he had a question on the topic of Taylor's imagining of Regent and Imp, it, it's that that bit where she kind of imagines Regent surrounded by throngs of of people who he's controlled, and she imagines the Imp as like a ruthless assassin. And he says it sounded like you were reading it in the light of Taylor wanting Regent to be that guy and wanting him to be that dangerous assassin. Does your read of the chapter change if it's in the light of her seeing those eventualities as worst case scenarios? So I think this was just us doing a a bad job of what we meant. Yeah, because um, that was not the interpretation I had. Yeah, I I wasn't trying to say that she was she was coaxing them into that path. I, if if I was trying to say anything, it was like she sees these as possibilities and she wants to steer them away from those possibilities. I don't know whether or not she thinks that she's been successful in doing so after that after that interaction with them. Yeah, and I think maybe where the confusion came from was just that I the the future that she steers Alec towards that's different from uh, the one that she sees for him still is questionable because it still involves him like taking control of people, but just using it as a threat rather than using it um, as actual, like controlling them in, in his own harem or anything. Um, so my, th my comment was just like, 
she sees this as a way of steering them towards a better alternative, but better, not great. And that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I I think we're on the same page there. So then there were, there are several comments, um, all of them really good. Um, and all of them kind of in this, in the thrust of saying, yeah, Taylor's done some bad things and, and, and we can, we can all, we can all agree to that. But, but the PRT is actually definitely culpable for a lot of what has transpired. And I think we were just, we just wanted to generally talk about that for a bit because that's true. And that is not something that we really emphasized on the podcast. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I will take culpability for this. I think we get caught up in, in our protagonists a lot, which I think makes a certain amount of sense, but we talk about the good thing she does and we talk about the bad thing she does and we focus on that stuff a lot and and we are not hitting the beats for the PRT who who I really do believe is is terrible. Um, I think this is a very corrupt organization that has done some truly unforgivable things um, in the name of of their belief system of doing good things. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, some of the bits from the comments to kind of uh, the, the convinced me the most or that that showed me most clearly were the, the kinds of horrible things they were letting happen prior to uh the leviathan attack the the, the protector was semi like turning a blind eye or, or really just not devoting full resources toward taking out like the abb and and the kaiser's group and, and all these other um all these other groups they were sort of they were sort of letting the cops and robbers thing happen even while these groups were doing some pretty heinous crimes on the ground. Yeah. And I think it's funny because like, I think the PRT is a perfect like example of, and I think Cauldron's another one of an organization that like starts heading down the road of doing um, bad things for good reasons and just has traveled way further down that road than our protagonist has. So we see her, like we see them, making these sacrifices and doing these things that we perceive as awful and and they are um but in their mind this is all justified they're maintaining balance they're keeping a, a high level of powerful capes alive so that they can fight back against the endbringers there there's justification behind everything they do but yeah the things that they do the things that they tolerate are pretty terrible i mean the a- abb is not a good organization at all and they allowed them to exist we we see with alexandria in this chapter like the level of threat she has and, and, um, that, that is, it is believable that she could at any moment just go out into the city and take down anyone. Um, and and they, they don't, they don't do that. Yeah. I guess one thing I tried to emphasize in, in my own comment was like, there are definitely some heinous things that are done by, for example, what you just described with Alexandria, where she's, she's sort of reckless, um, Pigot's willingness to basically kill these, teenagers for this you know because she had had an opportunity to um and those should be set aside from just like the normal dysfunction of any large bureaucratic organization because i see i see the prt has a lot of problems some of them are due to the fact that it's corrupt from the top down but some of them are just due to the fact that it's a nationwide uh, uh bureaucratic organization with like with a lot of intentional internal checks and balances and anytime you do that, you're going to have, it's going to be a slow organization. It's going to be conservative in how it allocates its resources. Um, and, and people like Taylor who are very idealistic are going to see those as major flaws that almost can't be helped in, in organizations of that size. It would be my take anyway. Yeah. I think that's a really fantastic point. And I, I do think that Taylor's main problem in that is that she cannot differentiate between those two things. She can't differentiate between the true evil acts that are committed by people in this organization, in the name of this organization, and that just everyday bureaucratic red tape type issues that any organization this size uh, tends to produce. Those two things Mm -hmm. are the same to her. um, And they both annoy her. Yeah, I agree. So we also had a really great comment uh, from King Bob, I believe, and it was it it uh, it's said a lot of things, but the main thing that we wanted to talk about was this excellent analysis of Alex's character. Yeah, King, um, King Bob yeah. has throughout this run always come in and made these incredible comments about Alec. You can tell that Alec is clearly his favorite character and and a character that he's put a lot of thought into, more thought than I think you or I ever have. 
Um, and it's often that I get some of my most insightful uh, thoughts and opinions of Alec and Regent from King Bob's comments. So I think this one this week was like the best example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's fairly long, but, but basically I, I'm trying to remember the, the, the point that I wanted to take away from it exactly. Um, so yeah, like, like for example, one really interesting thing here was, uh, um, Taylor and, and Aisha having very different reactions to the idea of Alec using his power on, on, on them basically. So like Aisha kind of likes the idea because it's a form of showing her attention. In fact, it's, showing her an almost exclusive kind of attention. And whereas Taylor views it as taking away her control, which is like her greatest fear um, and related to her trigger actually. So um, it's just an interesting contrast of these two characters and their two reactions. But that was cool. Yeah, that's really fantastic. And I think that's absolutely spot on. That's great. Yeah. Um, did you have any other, any things you wanted to, to bring out there? No, I mean, I, I I'm going to be honest. I, I didn't read the comments until a couple days ago because I was, out on the film festival so i i saw it i saw that it was long and i said i need to check back and read this later and i i did um but uh i just i just wanted to call attention to it generally because there's yeah. a lot of really fantastic stuff in there that i am definitely going to take to heart as we explore the character going forward all right um unless there's anything else we can get into our beat by beat discussion of the arc no we got to do it because it's eight chapters and it's going to be real long yeah all right 22.1 Skitter, having surrendered at the PRT headquarters, is roughly subdued by the agitated PRT troopers. Clockblocker is there, and he asks her if it's a trick. And she says, yes, but not the way he's thinking. <laughs> so Clockblocker freezes her, and when she comes back from stasis, she's in shackles, and the room is full of law enforcement. Yeah, every Clockblocker-Skitter interaction so far has been so great, and uh -huh. this one is is really no exception. Uh, like that, that Taylor's... Yes, I'm trying to trick you, but not in the way you think is like classic Taylor. That's like exactly something she would say. Um, I also really liked <laughs> this little interaction, Matt, uh, where uh, Skitter says, do you need me to take a different position? And Clockblocker says, once upon a time, I would have had something clever to say in response to that. <laughs> and of course, Taylor doesn't get it at all. <laughs> no, right. Of course. Yes. What? Huh? Yeah. What? Well, no. huh? Really? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really perfect. It's. Like there's a lot of tension throughout the scene and throughout this entire arc. And this is one of those tension relieving moments that I think works yeah. really well. Yeah, it's important. So clock blocker and Miss Militia help her stand and then lead her past tag. They hand him off to uh, they hand her off to Triumph and, and a, PR, a PRT officer to go down the elevator. And uh, meanwhile, tag orders a defensive lockdown for the whole uh, facility. Yeah, there's a lot of really smart uh, decisions made here as far as who is there and where they are in position to tailor. Um, including triumph was I think a very deliberate move here because we see Taylor like comment about how that she she knows that she has no friends here she has no one with her and that's absolutely true um, and it's not it's not unintentional that the only two people that have shown any kind of sympathy towards Taylor in the past uh, are, are clock blocker and Miss Militia and they're, they're the ones standing by her side but then they give her away to triumph and the other PRT officer they pass her on and it's literally that um, that being guided through enemies and that pass off to that true, you have no friends here. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we almost think for a minute, like, Oh, this is going to be okay. Cause clock clock blocker and miss militia are going to, going to stay by her. And then immediately they, they don't. And she's taken underground and isolated. Yeah. And that's, that's, I mean, to tie into my prediction from last week, that's exactly what I said. That it was like, Taylor's not going to go to jail. Miss militia will be there to protect her. And I think we see almost immediately that, the pull that Miss Militia has in this organization is not enough to actually be able to do that. Right. So Triumph leaves her in a Type E containment cell, which is armed with electrocution and foam sprayers. The cell is fairly minimalist. There's a, a recessed toilet, a bed with extremely thin mattress, and a constant flow of cool air. And Taylor reflects on how long probably stayed in a cell like this. Yeah, and there's a lot of beats here related to not only how seriously the PRT is taking this situation, but but also kind of Taylor's mindset right now. Um, we see that she's in, that she comments that she's in shackles meant for really strong capes that can rend steel. She's put in the cell that, that she feels is strong enough to contain lung. Um, this is, kind of ties into Taylor's general thought that she thinks she's going to be treated cruel or she's cruelly. She sees the PRT as evil 
and therefore they will surely abuse her. In fact, she literally says that. She said, was this the point where the PRT officer beat me within an inch of my life while everyone else turned a blind eye? Like, she says that so matter-of-factly, like, it's going to happen. I'm just waiting for when. Um, yeah. It's a really, really great window into her psyche right now. Yeah, like, as bad as this organization actually is, she she actually thinks it's even worse, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, um, and, and I think that ties into what we were talking about earlier, about that that general, you know, bureaucratic, quote-unquote, evil um, versus the actual literal evil member, members in here. She sees the whole organization as corrupt to the core, when really I think the main problems is there's there's some very bad people in very powerful positions within the organization. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. So the uh, the female PRT officer who she's with goes into the cell with her and has her strip, investigates her clothes, and then has her shower. The water comes from a low faucet that sprays directly into the toilet. Uh, the PRT officer explains that there will be only six seconds of warning before people can barge in on her. Yeah, and this all feeds into Taylor's mindset about how inhumanely she's going to be treated, right? Um, and and I agree that like this is not the most humane way to treat someone, especially someone who hasn't actually been legally convicted of anything yet. Um, but the type of stuff that they're doing here is not too different from what you would do to any prisoner who has just come under custody. Like... They take her clothes off and search them. They check her for any uh, any foreign objects, and they take her personal items away from her. Um, the fact that they give her a warning before they barge in on her is nice, I guess. I mean, it's not great, but like, I just think this feeds into her mindset that like everything they're doing to her is bad. When, from I think a, a outside perspective, it's relatively normal. Yeah, right. It's like she's in 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 her inner monologue. She's sort of casting it as being inhumane. And it's like, well, I mean, it's what they have to do. It's how they're dealing with a dangerous person. Yeah, which she absolutely is. <laughs> yeah. So before letting her dress, the PRT officer slaps on some latex gloves and searches her. And Taylor tries to make a joke at this point about being allergic to bee stings. <laughs> She's making a joke, Scott. <laughs> a joke. Has this ever happened before? Um, I mean, she's tried before. <laughs> I loved her just inability to read situations at times. <laughs> Cracks yeah. me up. It's like what this moment needs is a little bit of levity. Yeah. I'm going to make this woman laugh. No. <laughs> nope. I'll try again in a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So uh, she listens in on the meeting of the protectorate and PRT discussing the meaning of her surrender. Dr. Yamada thinks that she might actually be surrendering based on her psychological profile. Tag thinks he's trying to bring down the PRT by forcing a jury trial where their dirty laundry will be aired. And Miss Militia thinks she's probably plotting something and it probably involves removing Tag. Taylor is disappointed that Miss Militia mentioned this detail that was from their prior conversations. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that they're kind of all correct here, <laughs> at least in some level. Um, I think Tag's probably the least correct, but she does kind of want to bring down the PRT as it is with him in charge, so uh, I'll count it. Um, I, that beat about Miss Militia's betrayal is interesting. I'm curious if you think it's as much of a breach of faith and trust that Taylor seems to think it is. I mean, it's not really, no. I mean, especially because, like, technically she works for and is a member of the Protectorate, so having the conversation with Skitter, if anything, was the betrayal. Um but Taylor views everything in an us versus them light. So if someone wrongs her, then they're a traitor. And yeah. And I don't think, I don't think she like goes into detail about what they talked about in their agreement. She's kind of very vague about, she's like, I just talked to her lately and she said she was planning something. And that's really yeah. all Miss Melissa said. She doesn't talk about their plan to like passive resistance and all that kind of stuff. Right. So. Right. Just, just saying she's not happy with tag is, is not news. <laughs> say, <laughs> say, say that. Saying like, oh, yeah, also, uh, I'm pretending to do a passive resistance thing or, or, or whatever would would be like would would be a betrayal because, it, you know, it, she. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Taylor dresses now in gray prison sweats labeled villain. Yeah. And I really love that we keep coming back to this importance of clothing and, and what it says about youth beat. Um, I think we're going to hit this again really wonderfully at the end of this arc. But here we have her literally being labeled a villain, like literally. And it's yeah. really perfect. Yeah. And this will serve a, a fantastic function later. 
Um, so Tag mentions that he has given her a plus two in every classification just to be extra secure. And this still doesn't make him paranoid enough to consider that Skitter can hear through her bugs, <laughs> as she's doing right now. Uh, but he does cover his mouth so she can't lip read. And he says they're going to let her stew. So at this point, uh, they called her a, a Master 8. But then Tag said they gave her a plus 2. So she's like a Master 10 and 2 everything else, which is crazy. Um, uh-huh. That's really strong based on our, our understanding. Uh, I, I do like I do like that you pointed out that bit of irony that they're being super paranoid, but she's hearing their paranoia because <laughs> they're not paranoid enough. Yeah. I mean, it's probably a legitimate thing in her case, because if you go through all the all the classifications, she can sort of approximate almost all of them with her power. So, yeah, yeah. no, I think you're right. And I, I, I don't want to overanalyze it because I think we forget that the, the function of those ratings is literally just to make sure that soldiers take the proper prepared, amount of caution. Yeah. yeah. So which in this case is exactly why they would give her those classifications. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so uh, he he also mentions bringing in help and starts a preemptive media campaign against the undersiders, and they talk to our man Stan about it. Yeah, so I wanted to take this moment, and I think we're going to hit this beat again near the end of the arc, more specifically. But I've been I've been tossing in my head about uh, the PR that the PRT takes on, and how uh, how much they kind of manipulate the truth and the, and the story and their perception through public relations and how much Taylor kind of hates that. She sees that as dishonest and disgen- disingenuous and, and it's one of the reasons she doesn't like the PRT. Um, but that this obsession with image and how you're perceived is something that Taylor does really well. There's not a huge difference between Taylor's uh, lead by fear mentality and then public relations in the PRT. And I think this is something that Taylor will grow to realize as we move into further into this arc. But uh, something that jumped out at me here and, and I've kind of been tracking for a while now. Yeah, that's interesting. She's she's a little bit hypocritical about that. And it's just like, it, of course, it's different, right? Because 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 the image that she's putting up as a villain, then she has to lead through fear because the image that they're putting up is hero. Then they have to uh, express this narrative of them being the wonderful, always in the right, helping out you, the common man type people. Um, so it's, right. it's, it's different, but the, their goal is the same is to, to produce an image of, of who they are. That's not necessarily uh, entirely accurate. Yeah, yeah, totally. So she senses all the PRT officers in capes running around, setting up defenses and preparing for any eventuality. And, and she thinks of it as the PRT office buzzed like an anthill I'd kicked. Which is a really amazing metaphor because it works uh, on its own. But it also, when you think about it, Taylor can control ants. So maybe this is a window into how she is viewing the situation right now, like that she feels uh, even even now, like completely in control. Yeah, I think that's valid because the the wording of that sentence is like it, it isn't like a kicked anthill. It's like an anthill I'd kicked. Yeah, she's she's the active force in that sentence. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, there's this funny moment where uh, the wards are talking about the surrender and kind of trying to figure out what it means. And somebody mentions Echidna and and the crucible is like, again, with the Echidna thing, can't you it's classified everyone kind of kind of puts him down it's, it's kind of kind of funny i thought yeah it is funny and i think it tracks with something we talked about a couple arcs ago as well how how at the school the people that had survived the events of the brockton bay disaster segregate themselves from everyone else they consider themselves different possibly better that they've earned the right to be part of an exclusive group um and it's kind of like that crucible is new to this team he hasn't earned the right to be part of the team and that moment is kind of an indication that they're still keeping him at arm's length with all this stuff. Um, you could say, Matt, that he he hasn't been through the the crucible <laughs> yet. Maybe. There are also there, there are several comedic beats involving crucible in this chapter, actually. So. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then he's Taylor the new Kid Win. Yeah, he is, because Kid Win is cool now. Didn't, didn't you hear? I don't know how the uh, fuck that happened. <laughs> So so now Taylor senses the Alcots arrive and Scott Dinah has cut her hair short. <laughs> I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot with this, but Wildbow really does enjoy using external changes, you know, the fashion, glasses, hairstyles to represent change in character. He really likes doing that. And I think it's it's valid. 
Um, and I think there's a, a reason you and I often like fall back on pointing out how cinematic worm is or can be. Um, and it's not just because we both really like movies. <laughs> um, I think it's one of the reasons is that the wild boat understands the power of an image. And even if that image only is in your mind's eye. And so like, you just get this, this idea of, of her with a different hairstyle looks different, more confident. And you get an idea in your head of, of her being a changed person before she actually ever says a word. Yeah. Right. It's the kind of thing where it affects you subliminally. Um, and, and then when you think about it, you, you can think through the, the, the reason for it. Like she specifically, I, b- I believe that's one of the things that she picked out when she was saying like, my parents aren't going to want me back because, because I, I look weird now. My hair is all weird. And, uh, it kind of like, kind of like with Emma where her hair became part of her, her, her struggle, her trauma basically. And, and so she had to change it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Tag has Dinah come in and he grills her over how this all happened. Um, and she says she didn't know this would happen exactly. Uh, but Tag accuses her of actually having helped Skitter. Even Miss Militia believes there has to be a greater plan at work. And Dinah admits that she does indeed think that it's good that Skitter will do damage to the PRT. Um, and, and also admits she's still here because I told her to be. And she says that she'll lie if they ask her about any further numbers and and says, whatever happens from here on out, it makes the end of the world a little less bad. Yeah. So I think that kind of confirms my prediction from a couple weeks ago that Skitter's um, being exposed, her walking out of the cafeteria was all part of this original 96 percent whatever prediction um, and that that it was she was just a little uh, a little hidden with the details of when she would be captured and and all that so um i think that's really cool like it, it's it's crazy how we go in this moment or we see taylor in this moment going from like um being so disappointed and confused by dinah to kind of understanding her yeah 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 i think this is this is really so, sort of minor but it's also really necessary um because it's easy to forget that it was you know a full it was over an arc ago now that we that we had that moment where she felt really betrayed by dinah and so it's it's important that we before we move too far away from that moment that we sort of get some clarity where where we have I mean we, we kind of had her think through it when she was sitting in front of the gravestone but this is basically Dinah saying like look I did what I did for a reason and it's and, and the reason is not that I hate Taylor and want revenge on her so that that gives us kind of that little bit of reassurance that we need I think yeah and it's one thing for Taylor to uh, work through it on her own but it's another to get it confirmed by the source it's right right yeah yeah so yeah and before she leaves she says i'm not a good guy i'm not a bad guy i'm done working for other people answering their questions when i don't want to i work for me and for everyone and uh tag continues to antagonize her uh, stupidly pattern matching himself to coil's behavior in dinah's eyes at least yeah but the difference here is that she doesn't back down she uh like summon strength almost whereas before she kind of would cow down to coil and cow down to that authority that's holding themselves over and she's a she's a different person now she's confident she's strong she knows what she has to do and she's not really afraid of the consequences of those things anymore and i i really do enjoy the nice touch that her parents are there with her that that her parents are supporting her because like you said that goes back to her worst fear that her parents were gonna uh, reject her um and and we see that now uh, weeks later that that is still not true that they are still supporting her it's really good. yeah yeah it is nice on that level for us to see the evidence of of taylor's good deeds here in this yeah. moment yeah absolutely so miss militia finally notices that taylor's bugs have accumulated on the outer window and are acting very agitated and they realize at this point that skitter can hear them and then this causes dinah to leave abruptly because she can't communicate with taylor or the numbers change yeah this is i mean like it, beyond a shadow of a doubt tags treatment of Dinah was super hostile and mean and really fucked up. And, and we see skitter in this moment, know that and get so agitated that she stops paying attention to her bugs. Um, she kind of loses focus and makes their swarming <laughs> really obvious. It's a, it's a nice little beat. Um, the, the one thing before we move on from this, I did want to point out is just this, this beat where Taylor says odd to think how much time I dedicated to Dinah and how little I really knew her. There was this only now and the discussion we had prior to me taking her home so little. And I think you and I talked about this in the past before. Um, so I just wanted to, to draw attention to it here. 
Because we did talk about like for all this Dinah motivated plot we've seen in Taylor, she really knew her as a person very little. And I, I like that Taylor points that out here. Yeah, 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 it's it's good. So the PRT doesn't communicate much more worth listening to after this point, now that they know that she's listening. Kidwin's system, based on Sears' power, is deployed to destroy her bugs. And all we really find out is that many more protectorate capes are coming. Yeah, shit's going down. They're taking this super seriously. Yeah. So Miss Militia and Tag finally come to ask what happened with Flechette. And Taylor implies that she was responsible for the defection, even though she doesn't really know what's going on. And then uh, Tag responds to this by having her brought to the interrogation room. Yeah, and again, we see that Skitter is just posturing here. She has she, Flechette was news to her. She had no idea uh, what happened to her. Like she, they ask her if she's regent, and she says no. And then in her mind, she's like, "I hope it wasn't." <laughs> yeah. But but she's going to take advantage of the situation. Any situation that makes her look more threatening, more fierce, she's going to take advantage of that. It's basically public relations, uh, just yeah. on on the different side. So there's that beat again. Yep, absolutely. The tailor mentions that Tattletail will stop restraining the Undersiders from coming to rescue her uh, at 8.30 sunset. Um, she's uh, she's not showing a ton of humility here. She's basically nope. blackmailing them from the moment she enters the room. Um, then she wants her lawyer. She wants him now. She has her demands. And in return, the PRT gets to look good. Uh, if not, it's war. Yeah, so one of the things Taylor does do here is use uh, Valefor and Butcher and the action she took against them as kind of leverage for how far she and her team will be willing to go if they're left unchecked, um, which, which I think, like, I, we got a lot of flack last week for the whole Butcher thing. Um, people did not agree with us that that was a, not a good thing to do. But I think this, to me, is the text proving that these were, like, cruel and unusual things. Um, like Taylor specifically did fucked up things in the days leading up to turning herself in for this very purpose. This whole rule f through fear thing was for a very specific person purpose to show the PRT what we are willing to do to people that, that cross us. Um, so I, like I get why people like were mad at us for the butcher thing, but I really, I really do think the text is saying here that this was an escalated violent, uh, kind of horrible thing. And it was cruel. And I don't because I don't think I don't think Taylor's threat works otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And what's I think what's interesting at this point is that she doesn't at all feel bad about those things. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a, a, a sign of character development, perhaps in a, in a frightening direction, because she's felt bad about much lesser things than blinding someone possibly permanently. Um because like she's she's just so she's so far down this path of being able to justify things that she doesn't even have that twinge of remorse about it. It's just like, yeah, I did it. It, it was because he was a bad guy. And uh, now I'm going to use this to make people scared of me. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think <clears throat> we will see her walk that back a little bit near the end of this arc. But um, in, in this moment, she's she's got her mission. She's focused and she doesn't have time to think about those bad things other than how yeah. they can be used to further her goals. And, and I wanted to point out especially that so this is pretty much the end of this chapter and I wanted to point out that like we don't really know what her plan is until pretty pretty much this moment and, and, and even now we don't fully know what it is but basically we we kind of had in the back of our head like okay she's she's surrendering what what is she doing what is her plan and you kind of have this you know you're, you're almost like it, okay so she's she's surrendering and she's gonna put herself on the mercy of the, of the court maybe. And she's going to, yeah. she's going to just try to become it, try to become a hero and pay her penance and, and, and apologize for all the bad things she's done. And from the moment they start talking to her, she's like, she's basically saying, no, I'm not really surrendering. I'm, I, I, I'll, I'll let you, I, I'll let you make me into a hero. If you comply with my ridiculous demands, otherwise <laughs> we're going to attack your, compound and i'm gonna be free again yeah um which is not at all the same thing as i surrender no not at all and this is not this is not how i was expecting it to go like the the, the dramatic build-up to that surrender moment seemed to me that yeah she was really just saying this is the right thing to do i have to do this and it's not it's it's not her surrendering really it's just her using this as another bargaining chip yeah, yeah. it's kind of like dr y yamada says she does want to surrender but it's against her nature to just 
surrender surrender she has to surrender in a way where she gets all kinds of concessions right right yeah the, the my favorite part of this whole conversation that ends this chapter though is this um this moment where miss melissa says you said you weren't going to do any harm to the prt um and taylor replies if things go that way it's because the prt is hurting the prt which wouldn't be an isolated incident which i mean it's kind of like a weirdly twisted way to look at that i mean it's not entirely untrue because they escalated things but also she's here and saying if you don't give into my demands my team will attack you and release information on you that will hurt you and make you look bad and it won't be their fault it'll be yours <laughs> yeah it'll be yours for not complying with my blackmail like that's yeah <laughs> right taylor okay sure whatever yeah you gotta you gotta be willing to compromise to my blackmail yeah yeah well we'll get into all that so 22.2 um, Miss Militia gives her a phone and she calls her lawyer, Mr. Kaye, um, who is in her territory chatting up her people. She orders an elaborate snack through him and then he heads to the PRT office. Yeah, that was the, the snack was a weird beat. Um, <laughs> but I think it's just characterizing of Kaye, who I yeah. love so much. Yeah, um, I, I agree. It's just showing how like uh, laissez faire he is about all this right. villain cape stuff. You yeah. Know? Um, I, I was really excited when we heard I heard that we were bringing a lawyer into this stuff because like the legal side of parahumans is something that's always kind of been hinted at in the background. Um, we've seen one trial with poor Canary, um, but, but we really kind of dive deep into how all that works in this chapter and the next. And uh, I like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So Tag talks about how he can't understand the trauma capes go through. And then he talks about uh, Lausanne. And how him and his people shot men, women, and children after the Seamurg attack made everybody crazy. Two years of fighting those people, and then they closed off the city and massacred everybody. Yeah, I'm sure Tag knows nothing about trauma. <laughs> right? And, like, this is – this gets back to a beat that I think we've talked about before, but how Worm continues to deal with the idea of trauma in increasingly complicated ways. Because I think it would have been easy to just say – you know, superpowers are a metaphor for trauma and have that just be it, have that be the metaphor. But but Wildbo isn't interested in just that comparison. He wants to handle trauma like across the entire spectrum. Um, so, again, we have all of our capes suffering from these terrible traumatic events that fed them and their powers. But we also take the time to show all these non capes suffering their own kind of trauma. Like we've seen Emma, we've seen Charlotte, we've seen Pigo, and now we have Tag. These people's traumas are are almost equally bad. They're awful, awful things have happened to them, and it it causes them to do comparably awful things in return. Like Emma might not have killed, might not have the power to kill thousands of people, but she did have the power to ruin one person's life. Um, and I just think it's it's really cool how we 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 explore trauma in all its various shapes and sizes, um, super powered and not. Yeah, and in the case of Pigo and, and Tag. You could argue that for, for both of those people, actually, their traumas led them to reaching for more power so that they right. could have those kind of devastating effects. We, we, we sort of know that was the case with Pigot, yeah. where she, she, was, she, was she was a PRT trooper. She's probably like a pretty good person. And then something really terrible happened, and she, she was really angry about it. And, and it drove her to become the kind of, of relentless and, and uncompromising person that she was. Yeah, I, um, I think you're right. I think the difference being then then the capes who experience trauma are gifted with power, whereas the non capes who experience trauma have to have to fight for their power. Yeah, yeah, and and, and Emma gets power in her own way. It's it's yeah. like high school social power, but yeah. you can imagine her becoming worse as she gets older. Actually, yeah, that's absolutely. interesting. This is not a theme that I had ever picked out, but this this idea that. If people don't get a superpower, then they crave some kind of power to exert their will on the world so they can make it a safe place for themselves. Yeah, I think that's I think that tracks. And I think we could look through a lot of the other people with trauma to to confirm that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So at this point, Tag talks about the birdcage and how he would rather execute cape criminals than use the birdcage. And he keeps pushing and grilling and being aggressive like this. And finally, his monologue is interrupted by the arrival of Kaye. Yeah, and I think Tag, in this moment, like Taylor tends to do sometimes, is make one hell of a convincing argument here. Um, this idea that um, it's more merciful to execute criminals than than keep them locked in a place as terrible as the birdcage. And I think it's something that uh, some of our listeners have leveled against us when we showed uncomfort 
with like the willingness to to casually execute people like when there was a, a, a hit order on cherish and they uh, i think melissa was just said just shoot her in the head um there's an argument here is 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 that outcome better than a lifetime of torture inside the birdcage or 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 furthermore what actually happens to cherish which is 10,000 times worse um i think it's a bit more complicated than that but i i think I think the most important thread that I pulled out of this speech of of tags is that as much as he he hates the birdcage, he's willing to use it. And I think we're we're supposed to see echoes in Taylor again here. Um, I think these two characters are are on some level very much alike. Um, on other levels, they're very different. I think Tag is an asshole, complete asshole. But um, like like Tag, as much as Taylor hates the PRT, she's willing to use it if it means accomplishing her goals. Yeah, yeah, that, that all that all makes sense to me. Yeah, my favorite part about this whole thing, though, is is when Tag kind of correctly points out that what Skitter has done in Brockton Bay is just going to encourage people to do the same thing in other cities, um, and maybe people not as altruistic as as Skitter will rise to power and rule way more cruelly than she ever has. And and of course, Taylor is not specifically uh, directly responsible for that, but she's not entirely blameless. It's, it's still something that tag has to deal with. Um, and, and it's something, it's part of, part of the reason why he's so angry with her because he, he has to make an example of her to discourage this in other places. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's maybe like the strongest argument that we see him make in perhaps this entire arc. In in my opinion, is this, this idea that like, like, look, like we can't just, basic game theory we can't just capitulate to your demands here because there's more at stake than just what you're threatening there's there's the consequences of the prt being seen to capitulate in this way and for a large organization that's disastrous and that's yeah. yet again this is a feature of large organizations as has nothing nothing to do with tag specifically as a person right i mean it's literally just like the united states saying we do not negotiate with terrorists like we exactly. can't we, we cannot as a country as a body in this world be seen to agree to those kind of demands right yeah no matter what you're threatening it would be worse for us to comply yeah yeah Yeah. so at this point uh taylor description fucks kaye uh he's (laughs) perfectly groomed and handsome uh except for some scarring on his face i I really this is a good beat because like i think it's been a long time a since we've seen taylor look at someone in that way um and, and b i think we've lived in a world of like like death and destruction and and dirt and grime to see someone that perfectly groomed that good looking is is like intentionally like showing a difference in in the type of person he is and he's he's just very different from a lot of the characters we've seen yeah no that's a good point so yeah kaye kicks everybody out of the meeting uh, and just has a, a private meeting with taylor so he goes over all the charges that are being levied against her so there's dozens of felonies, some domestic terrorism. Uh, it looks like Emma finally got around to filing charges for the punching incident. There's an absence of hero capes making personal accusations, presumably to avoid putting the heroes on the witness stand. And overall, we get a nice rundown of everything she's done, including treason, uh, apparently, when she declares herself ruler of her territory. Yeah, it, it's kind of hard not to laugh at the as these charges are read, just because the sheer amount of them, there's like... 50 cases of assault, 83 cases of assault. Like it's just, yeah, right. Just so many things. And especially the beats where Taylor can't specifically remember which charges go to which events. Like there's so much stuff that she's done that it all kind of bleeds together and she can't remember which, which belongs to which. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Right. And then she goes, um, he's like, anything else I should know about? I sort of arranged to have a psychopath kill herself. Um, however you'd charge putting maggots in somebody's eyeballs. In self-defense. <laughs> <laughs> self-defense. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and what's funny is, like, is she saying, is she phrasing it that way for his benefit or is she still kind of kind of justifying that? I uh, think on some level, I think that's what she believes. Because, I yeah. mean, if you and, and we will see uh, Alexandria echo that sentiment almost exactly later in the, yeah. the arc. But um, yeah. I think there's a certain level of of this justification to. Uh, he could hurt me later, therefore hurting him now is self-defense. Yeah, yeah. I actively went after him, and then when he fought back, I blinded him in self-defense. Yeah, <laughs> That's, that, that is pretty much what Alexandria does later, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 
So she confesses to him that she also killed a law enforcement officer, Coyle, and Kaye claims he's handled worse. Which is uh, a little disturbing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what kind of people have you been representing, Kaye? Yeah, I need uh, better call Kaye. It needs to be the next spinoff, I guess. Yeah. Big, um, so Kaye wants to have her charged as a minor and emphasizes the relatively valid extenuating circumstances that she's been placed under. And we have a little time jump as Kaye grinds out a contract stipulating Taylor's demands uh, with his law firm via the phone. Yeah, I like that you brought up that 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 um, the extenuating circumstances are relatively valid. And I, and I think I think it's easy to look at all her charges written down on a paper and write her off as a monster, um, just like Tag is doing. But we know that Taylor's more complicated than that. We know that she's been through hell, that she's helped people too. And while she does often act recklessly and, and without proper consideration, um, so do those people that act against her. So at the end of the day, nobody's perfect here. And and I think that should be considered or at least discussed when when talking about her choices. Um, yeah. and, I, and I do think that's something that you and I do. I think we get, you know, some some people say we don't do a good enough job of, of contextualizing the choices that she makes. But I, I think we we do. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, what we don't often do is talk about the fact that like her intentions are usually to like to save people and like for the greater good and so forth. Um, but I, I don't think that needs to be repeated every time, especially when the problem is not that her intentions are good. The problem is that she's justifying increasingly heinous things very tenuously connected to those intent, those, those good intentions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. To the, to the so. point where it's becoming easier and easier for her to just remove those excuses to be able to act without that rationalization as we'll right. see in a couple chapters. Yep. Yeah. So um, the deal that they're offering is surrender in exchange for admission to a certain number of crimes. And in exchange, the undersiders will be given unofficial leniency. Special allowances would be made regarding crimes in the future. Tag will retire and Miss Militia will take over. Yeah, I, I kind of joked about this on Twitter in my live read, but we've literally like flipped genre now. And I know just in like a legal procedural story. Um, and yet it really works like it really yeah. does. This is really engaging. Uh like the dialogue, everything that's going on here is super engaging. Right. That's, I mean, that's one thing that I love about this story is that he's able to so confidently move between, um, I don't know if genres is quite the right word, but, but styles. employ di- yeah, styles and just like different, different whole families of tropes that he's bringing to bear in the situation that he hasn't done a- at all prior to this. And now it's just seamlessly woven in. So yeah, Miss yeah. Militia thinks that, um, uh, rather, Taylor thinks that Miss Militia will be a better and ironically less conflict prone leader. <laughs> yeah. Um, Matt, I think Miss Militia is my favorite character in the story right now. Um, so I it, it's funny. I, Miss Militia is someone who's never wanted leadership. Like she specifically says that when she gets put in charge. Um, but maybe those are the type of people that make the best leader sometimes. She seems like the most level headed. I think she feels like someone who's legitimately good, but understands when and where her organization has failed and legitimately wants to improve it. Um, I think she's just great. Yeah. And she's seen how bad things can get. Unlike yeah. a lot of these people. Yeah. And I think that that's, I think that's such a difference in the source of her trauma, right? That, that like she had, she went through, she had her trigger event, but she went through hell before it. And she's seen like, yeah, like, like you said a couple of hours ago, she's seen real war. She's seen what it can do. She's seen the consequences for this escalation that everyone's talking about. So she has a much more level head about it that, than, than anyone else. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so the PRT higher-ups probably won't accept any of this. Uh, but Triumph, be, he's actually the first, I think, to, to suggest a compromise. And he, and he says, like, what if we had a figurehead leader at, as a compromise and, and have Miss Militia kind of be in charge de facto? And Taylor, like, immediately rejects this and says that this is not acceptable. Yeah, and I think this is the first instance of compromise mentioned and the first instance where you will see someone completely unwilling to do so. Um, and, and it's not just Taylor. Uh, this this whole thing turns into kind of a tag versus Taylor escalation fest where no one is willing to budge, no one wants to yield, and then Alexandria comes in a little later and does the same thing. But um, both sides are demanding compromise, but unwilling to offer any. Yeah, right. It, it takes... It takes way too long for anyone to even say like, okay, how about, how about 
this minor compromise. Yeah. It's yeah, there's no budging. Yeah. So Taylor makes another request. She wants the PRT to use her, even if she gets no credit. They can use her to keep hunting the nine. Um, but the PRT folks inform her that the nine have hit the Tinker Collective toy box. Um, and as Taylor reads through the capabilities of the toy box capes, we see how Bonesaw was able to use these various technologies um, to put together what she did in the fragment that we saw. Yeah, we're, we're sure slowly but surely building up uh, the Slaughterhouse Nine future threat, aren't we? Yeah. I guess they're gonna have to be like the Slaughterhouse a lot. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, like we're slowly but steadily uh, foreshadowing this stuff, and uh, it's gonna be really exciting when it finally pays off. Yeah, I guess. And terrifying. So, yeah. So since the Nine will be out of the picture for some time now, uh, the terms of Taylor's deal will need to change. So the PRT folks leave and Taylor overhears tags say something about her father. Yeah. And, and here I think is again where tag is escalating um, and not doing it smartly. Um, we're going to see how all this plays out, but um, it, it's a bad decision and, and there's bad decisions being made on both sides of this thing. Um, and this is tags. It's not yep. good. Bringing her dad into it is not smart. Yep. I think, I, I think, uh, yeah. So I think, uh, uh, what's, uh, Dr. Dr. Yamada basically says like, that's really not a good idea. Yeah, and yeah. he's like, Oh, I, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. So before we move on though, I'm curious what, what, what your opinion on this deal is overall before we, we start changing it. Like, is this a fair deal for the PRT as Taylor has presented it? Is it a fair deal for Taylor? Um, what, what is the most idealistic hopeful outcome if things had played out exactly the way Taylor wanted in this deal that they just accepted it. Yeah. I'm glad you asked this. Cause I've been th- like trying to think this through and like weigh it rationally. And it really doesn't seem fair to me. Like, like it, it's interesting cause when you're especially like many things, when you're reading this the first time through, you got your protagonist goggles on and it seems fair and it seems like they're being ridiculous but when you're really objective and you like weigh what she's offering against what she's asking, it's like she's not offering much at all. She she's she's yeah. basically it comes down to what she's offering is we're not going to have my supervillain team attack your base. Yeah, you're right. I mean that's like, ba- that's basically it. Yeah, and and which which like maybe the rational choice for the PRT would be like all right, look, we're just kicking you out. Like just, just kicking back, back out on the street because <laughs> like, like, like we're not going to give you anything. We don't want to have a fight with your allies. So just get out of here, get lost. Cause I, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. I mean, what, what she's asking for is government sanctioned rulership of Brockton Bay. Like yeah. she, they're good. She wants amnesty for these guys. They're going to be free to do whatever they want. Um, right. She wants the leader of the group removed and she wants the entire, uh, structural idea behind the prt change to allow a cape to be in charge that's a huge structural change in the organization that changes like the entire goal of the organization and i know that that was broken basically from the beginning but still to the people within the organization and the people outside the organization they were not aware of that and the, to put miss militia in charge almost seems to double down on this idea um that was never present uh before so yeah i, I think she's asking for a, a lot here and she feels like she's in a power position. Yeah. Because she's kind of blackmailing them. She says, my guys are going to come attack you. Um, yeah. And, and they're good. You wanted a war. You wanted escalation. Here's it going to come. And the only way you stop this is by giving me everything I want. Yeah. I feel like the most she could really get with the true quid pro quo would be getting tag, uh, to retire. Like, like I think she could probably legitimately force that if she were like, all right, I turned myself in in exchange I, I think this guy is bad news. I want him out. I think that she can maybe make the organization as a whole, like, you know, settle for that trade, but certainly not that plus all the rest of the things she asked for. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So 22.3, she's listening in on the heroes outside having their discussions. The wards are gossiping about what Taylor was asking for, confused and perhaps impressed that she wanted to go hunt the nine. Uh, this leads to Miss Militia telling them that Flechette has defected, which upsets all of them, especially Vista. And Miss Militia lets us know a little bit more about Flechette's background. She's always been moved between different homes, and she doesn't have much in the way of attachments. Poor Vista. 
Poor Vista that yeah. I don't, I still don't know how she got out of the situation she was in with Echidna, but she's better. Yeah. Anyway. Um, we, we, we do learn that she managed to somehow kill Shatterbird. Yeah. Though, so. Yeah. Which is crazy. Um, yeah. I, I do really like this moment though, because we see Taylor like trying to listen to like six different conversations at the same time. And it, like, it's almost too much information for her. Um, and here's where I, like, I, I want to talk about tag and I want to talk about tag with the caveat that I, I think he's really a piece of shit and he does terrible things, but I think, he's, <laughs> <laughs> I think he's also a human being. And there's this really weird beat here where tag, like they're talking about for They're talking about what happened to her and tag interjects. And he says like, they basically accuse him of doing something to her. And his response here is very human. Um, he says, no, we didn't do a thing to her. Everyone that's been in Brockton Bay over the past few weeks and months has dealt with a lot. And I think this is her wrestling with something on her own. I have immense respect for Fouchette and all I can do, all we can all do is hope that she comes to her senses. So Matt, who's this like rational, calm, understanding man suddenly that we're seeing talk to the rest of the team? Like, could it be that, that the tag that Taylor sees is just an image that tag is putting forth like a scare tactic, just like she does. Um, I think there's some truth to that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because my read again, probably wearing my protagonist glasses was no, this, this quote that you just read was tag putting on a facade to try to make the wards think that he's a good sensitive man who cares about Flechette, but actually he's this monster that we've seen in the other scenes. But, but I think there's a really good chance that you're onto something there because nobody is simple, right? Like, yeah. And I, I mean, but, you're absolutely yeah. right that it could be that. Um, it, it absolutely could be that. But I, I prefer to think as people as a little bit more complicated. And I, and again, I yeah. want to say Tag sucks. He's terrible. Uh, the, the manipulation and the cruelty that he displays to Taylor is absolutely fundamentally wrong. I am not I am not saying that. But I do think I do like that we we possibly get a little beat here of seeing him as being a little bit different from that. Yeah, well, like I doubt he sees himself as a villain, so no. he's probably he's probably willing to extend some sympathy to somebody like Flechette. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. I definitely just read it as like him being like, "Oh yeah, uh, Flechette. Yeah, no, um, it wasn't my fault. You know, I, I love her. She's great. She's the best." Um, but yeah. maybe it was genuine. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the, yeah, this is the point when Yamada tells Tag that Danny is a sore spot with Taylor. Um, doesn't stop him though. Nope. <laughs> doesn't take the world's best shrink to to figure that one out though. Yeah. Even though I appreciate <laughs> Jessica. <laughs> so Miss Militia calls Danny um, back in the office or back in the in- interrogation room. Kaye obliquely suggests that Taylor use any leverage that she might have access to. He also wants to bring things back into official channels, more U.S. government, less PRT, which removes some uh, options from the table but takes power away from TAG and the PRT structure. Yeah, this is really interesting because uh, the PRT kind of operates as this organization that is both part of the government but distinct and separate from the government. And and it got me thinking maybe this is like the reason the organization has set, had problems like corruption problems in the past. It like actually needs more government oversight than it actually has. Like the fact that they're able to exist in this legal gray area because they just haven't notified the actual law like enforcement of the world um, is kind of interesting. Yeah, right. I think there's actually some real world parallels to how all that could yeah. potentially go off the rails. Yeah. In, in recent world history. Um. Yeah, so so there's this this moment where I, I think it's Kaye asks her, "Are there any points you're willing to compromise on?" And and Taylor answers, "It doesn't matter because he isn't willing to meet me halfway." And like I wanted to point out at this moment, like is that actually true that that he's not willing to meet her halfway? Yeah, I mean, I think yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I think I think it is true that the tag is going to fight her tooth and nail for everything. Um, but would he be willing to compromise if he saw her compromise? I think that's possible. Um, I, I think there's this, there's this interesting dynamic here where like tags side is the entire PRT and there's seemingly people within the PRT that would be willing to meet her halfway, but he just doesn't seem like he would be one. 
Whereas as Taylor's kind of alone on her side and it's very clear that she's not willing to meet anyone halfway. So I, I don't know. I think it's a very complicated answer to a very simple question. Yeah. I mean, he, she, she can't possibly, I guess I was just, it's stuck in my, stuck in my craw because she can't possibly know that he isn't willing to meet her halfway because she hasn't made any offers. Like, so that, that that's, yeah, it's just, you have to at least offer the the slightest inkling of a compromise and then if they still reject that then you can say oh they're not willing to compromise but right i mean the only the only part we've had is is taylor's opening offer which was rejected and then each side goes back to their own prospective sides and is talking and planning and of course i i think taylor's idea that tag is not willing to compromise is motivated by instead of coming back with a counter offer his move is call her father and bring him down here to confront his daughter um which is not a great negotiation tactic, but um, yeah, I think you're right that that we don't fully know whether these agreements are going to actually go anywhere or not yet. Yeah, right. Yeah, it certainly seems not so far. So Danny arrives, and finally Taylor is actually nervous. I think for the first time, really, in, almost in this arc. Yes. So 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 am I. Very nervous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there there yeah. was a part here that I wanted to point out to you, which um, is small, but I think really great. Um, because Miss Melissa asks, asks Danny if, if he knew, uh, who, who Taylor was, what she was. And he, he firstly says yes. And then he changes it to no afterwards. And I really like that beat because I think that represents Danny's guilt. Um, he feels like he's responsible for this and he feels like he should have known. So his first instinct is answer yes to the question. I really don't think Danny knew. Um, I think when he changes his mind, no is the correct answer, but he's so guilty about not knowing that he's like forcing himself in a situation where surely, surely I saw it. Surely I saw the signs. It's just, I failed to do anything. Yeah. Right. He's probably doing the, the tattletale thing where, yeah. where he's like, oh yes, I, I did know on some level. And it's like, no, actually you, you didn't. And I mean, p- people do this to themselves when, yeah. when something catches them off guard, they're like. They, they go through their memory and they convince themselves that not only should they have seen it, but, but they did see it. Damn it. It's like, no, it's not, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's just how the mind work. works. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So tag and Miss militia take him to tags office and they start showing him all of Taylor's crimes intentionally putting him off balance and Taylor too, because she can hear all this and tag knows it. So tag says a likely outcome for Taylor is execution or the birdcage. And Kaye heads to interrupt the meeting um, and then they all together come back downstairs to Taylor. Yeah. And I think we're seeing tags uh, eventually fatal flaw here that he needs. He has to escalate. And, and and the more pressure he feels, the more he has to escalate this. This involving of Taylor's dad was so like so fucked up and like so beyond what was called for at all. Um, and, and I think we, later we find out what the PRT is actually trying to do with Taylor. This whole situation is actually just this really kind of complicated plan. Um, but for now, Tag just comes off as this constantly escalating dickhole. Yeah. <laughs> and it's hard. Yeah, it's well, hard to feel anything for him. Well, even I mean, the plan itself is based in escalation. Like, it's, right. That's not fake. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's stage managed maybe more than we realize. But that doesn't mean they're not escalating. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, right. um, Danny sees her and he's visibly overcome by a mixture of emotions, a dominant one seeming to be anger. And Taylor thinks he's going to strike her, but instead he hugs her for several minutes. Oh, Matt, <laughs> this moment, it's so good. Yeah. We've, we've been so much tension for for 22 arcs yeah. around this around this question of 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 her dad finding out her identity. And, and he's found it out. But this is their first meeting after that point. So. Yeah. And we legitimately had no idea what to expect here. Um, yeah. I think, I think it, it, it literally could have gone either way. Danny could have gone either way here and, and, and bless his heart. He, he, he hugs his daughter. He loves his daughter and, and he stays by her side and, and we'll see as he moves into this, that he doesn't necessarily defend her, but he's going to stay with her. Um, yeah. And it's great speak to the consistency like i think if you were to go back and read the first interlude of the book which is danny you would find that this is very much the same character exactly the same character he 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 struggles with frustration with his daughter he struggles with with anger a little bit he he loves her he doesn't know what to do though he he's he's a little bit lost that's that's our danny and and we love him yeah yeah 
So Tag goes over all the terms again, this time uh, with with everyone present. And, ta- and uh, Taylor says that she's willing to go to the birdcage in exchange for getting what she's asking for. She believes this is the only way to get people working together effectively. So did you believe that in this moment that that's actually legitimately something she would be willing to do? Um. I didn't think she was posturing there. I, I thought I thought she's basically saying like, I, I will, as long as I get what I'm asking for, you don't even have to use me to hunt the nine. You can put me in the birdcage, but I'm not budging on what I'm asking for. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I think this this tracks with with the Taylor we've seen before. She's always been this self sacrificing person, almost to to a fault. And like. Yes, she is willing to do terrible things to other people if she believes them to be the right things to do, but she's also willing to do those terrible things to herself if she believes them the right thing to do. We saw that with Echidna, and I think we're seeing it again here, and uh, I respect her for that on a certain level, that she believes so strongly in it that she's willing to sacrifice herself for it. Yeah, yeah. So Tag goes on to talk about each of the undersiders and the bad things that they've done, bringing Danny up to speed on, as Tag would have it, the monsters that Taylor calls friends. And then Taylor is forced into the position of defending each of them. Yeah. And I think this is a a lesson in the importance of context (laughs) Um, because like as Tag makes them out to be, they're all monsters. Like the way he reads out the things that they've done, which are all true things, by the way, um, they they come off as truly monstrous and then Taylor is forced to defend them and then you kind of see her point of view too you see yeah like they went through really hard stuff like Alec was raised by this terrible human being that warped who he is um Rachel has gone through terrible things Lisa has gone through terrible things like you you kind of get it all um but like the thing is that that Flag can't see Taylor's side of this Taylor can't see Flag's side they can't see those sides of these people and it just makes me think that these are really the worst two people you could pit against each other like at this moment because they're just not going to back down yeah 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 he's very much her antithesis in, in some ways yeah yeah it's like the, the like you said the worst person in the situation um and it's interesting because she she actually when guru is brought up she kind of depersonalizes into her bugs yeah and this is a really i think of a subtly important beat that sets up what goes down in the next chapter. I think we've been like talking about this trick of Taylor for a while now that, that she can disembody and, and escape from her emotions into her bugs. Um, and I think this serves to remind us again of that's a thing that she could do. And, and it's again, like we talk about this a lot with wild bow, this, this really like subtle setup that totally makes sense within context of the moment, but also serves to throw some exposition our way to remind us of the thing that Taylor can do. And I just, I just love how it's done. Yeah. Right. And, and it's also, I I think this is a well-timed reminder of her connection to the undersiders because it isn't too long after this, that, that basically it isn't, isn't, it isn't too long after her verbalizing her commitment and, and love for them basically that somebody comes along and starts threatening them directly. So, yeah. 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 So, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I also like how this is set up because now she's not just defending herself to tag. She's defending herself to her dad, um, yeah. indirectly because her dad is present and, and then tag is kind of using him against her. And, and he even <laughs> asks Danny, does he want the undersiders in charge? And Danny says no, but then he admits that some people do. Yeah. And, and I really, I really love Danny here, Matt. I really do. Um, because I, I do think Danny reads that list as Tag gives it to him, that list of, of who Taylor's friends are, and he sees Tag's side. He sees them as the monsters. He does not see Taylor's side. He can't envision these as people, these people as the way that Taylor envisions them. But unlike Tag, he recognizes that he can't see them that way, and he recognizes that there's so much more going on here that he doesn't understand and couldn't understand. So when it comes down to it, he... He recognizes that the only thing he has to truly trust in is his daughter. And, and he does that. Um, and it's so wonderful. Like, it's so like it's just this this faith he has in his daughter, which I don't know if is repaid exactly. But um, it is this really wonderful character beat for him. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, too. 
So in Tag's mind, it's uh, we talked about this before, actually. It's worth losing Brockton Bay to not give in to what Taylor's asking for. And, and you know, he really, really doesn't want this new status quo that she's offering. And, and it's essentially because of what we said before, like capitulating on this would, would undermine their whole organization. Right. But it's like they're arguing past each other. They both think that defeating the other will put the world in the best possible position to survive long term. They both think the other is expendable towards this goal. And they're both escalating the conflict because they agree to this so strongly that just about anything is worth it. And it's just like just bumping into each other. There's nothing that you can do to fix this. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. So finally, though, Taylor's leverage comes through and they realize that Sierra is now owner of the whole downtown area surrounding the portal. <laughs> hey, hey, Matt, remember that uh, prediction I made about Sierra quitting the undersiders and, and Taylor uh-huh. not taking it well? Yeah. Um, oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was wrong. Uh, you know, you can only expect to get like 90% of them right. So. <laughs> I am not that high. <laughs> it's pretty good, though. Uh, but, you know, Tag is unimpressed by this little maneuver. He He really isn't the kind of man to be swayed by moves like that. Um, and Taylor points out in response to his kind of failure to, to budge on this that none of this would have been necessary if Tag didn't think he was above the game and the unwritten rules of the capes. Yeah, and I, I don't think she's wrong here. Um, Tag did break the rules, but Taylor breaks the rules too, right? Like, yeah. didn't, didn't declaring herself as Queen of Brockton Bay break the rules? Like, didn't they stop playing the game once they declared themselves leaders of the entire city? Like it stops being cops and robbers when you literally take over the entire city. It's, it hasn't been the game for some time now. Um, and a lot of that is, is because of Taylor, not all of it, of course, but a lot of it is. Yeah. I mean, we, we could get fairly micro on this, but like I'm remembering when trickster visited Accords territory and, and he was like, yeah, it's customary to pay a, a small fee or, or whatever. And if you're going to work in somebody else's territory, but the, the way, the way the undersiders are set up, they're like, no, you can't do business in our territory. Yeah. Um, unless you basically join us on some level, um, which is, I, I don't think a typical situation. Yeah. <clears throat> so Danny asks Miss Militia what she thinks about all this. And Miss Militia expresses frustration and anger with Taylor for putting the heroes in this situation with no winning moves. And she says that she hates Taylor for making them call her. Yeah. So um, I think this ties into something we were talking about earlier, that Miss Militia never really wanted to be a leader. Um, She doesn't really like being the one to have to make those kind of decisions. She doesn't want it. She doesn't like it. And it's really difficult for her. Um, I really like the line where she says that we're dealing with the devil um, and which is very Im- heavily implied to be Taylor. <laughs> um, and I-, I think it's just this really great moment and that her beat lands pretty hard. Although I had no idea who, who it was at that, that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we find that pretty quick though. So, so tag is done with Danny being here and kind of tells him he should leave, but Danny decides not to. That's my boy. Yeah. Stay with your daughter. So they wait a few more minutes for this new guest to arrive. And I just was wondering if you had any idea who this was at this point. No, I, I think maybe in the back of my head I did on some level because who else could it have been? But in the moment, no, no. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't. But Taylor senses this person approach on foot from a distance. It's this, this scary woman who moves with confidence and perfect control like the Siberian did around her teammates. Uh, and Taylor knows who it is almost immediately, but she thinks the person I found myself comparing her to wasn't the Siberian. It was me. <laughs> what a wonderful moment, Matt. Yeah. Um, the, the respect, uh, the fear, the, the, that real leadership. And I think we've been doing this Taylor tag comparison thing for a while here um, in this arc, but also in the last one. But um we have to go back to Alexandria's interlude to remind ourselves of just how like Alexandria and Taylor are as well. Um, and, and this is actually something I wanted to address because I, I did notice a comment that we didn't talk about last week that said something to the effect of that. I, that, that this person, and I can't remember who their name is. I apologize to that person, but that, that it says something about the quality of the writing of worm that you can compare so many of these other characters to the protagonist. 
And I agree completely. And I, I wanted to talk about like the fundamental role of an antagonist in a story and why having an antagonist that is a foil to your main character works so well. And, uh, like, I, I think, you know, I, like we, we tend Matt to think of antagonist as bad guy. Um, it's just like short for bad guy, but really when we're referring to the story structure definition of that, it's just someone who opposes the protagonist protagonist. Like the, the word itself has no opinion on who is right and who is wrong. Their relationship is merely just, they both want something and the other person is preventing them from getting it. So the way to write that character is interesting is to make the thing that he wants understandable. And I think that the way to do that even more interestingly is to make them related back to your main character to, to have them have similar traits, but in a different way. And I think that's what worm does so well constantly with these characters. And it's a reason we're comparing them back to Taylor is because these antagonists are fully fleshed out real characters who relate back to our protagonist and her goals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a really long is, thing, but <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that reminded me actually, um, speaking of protagonists and, and antagonists, um, that, I think Wildbo has, has said elsewhere that he he writes his his protagonists um, based on based around their weaknesses, and he writes his villains and his antagonists based around their strengths. Uh, I, I don't I don't think I phrased that correctly at all, um, but but uh, I think I think that's I think that's actually writing advice that I've seen elsewhere, and and that's interesting here because Alexandria is is essentially being an antagonist here, even though she's somebody who Taylor looked up to in the past. Um, and, and she's, she's this incredibly strong, you know, unstoppable force. Um, but, but it's actually there. It's actually her strength that almost is her, is her downfall in a, in a ironic way. Um, yeah. And I think it's so much more narratively fulfilling for that antagonist to echo your protagonist in some way to, especially if you're telling a story about how a person goes from being one thing to become another thing, it, it pays to have the person they're in conflict with be someone that's further along that trail than you are. Like it just, it just works better. Um, so we, yes, we keep comparing people back to Taylor um, just because she's our protagonist, but also because these people relate to her and they, they tell about her, either her future state or, tell us more about her in the present yeah yeah i think uh back when back when we had alexander's interlude we were talking about how her her costume is is black and gray which is essentially just like taylor's um she makes her quip about blood being easier to hide and uh it's like yeah she's she's being set up as you know back at that point in time she was maybe where taylor is now actually yeah could be yeah yeah, so yeah, so Alexandria arrives and we move into 22.4. Oh shit, here we go. So Taylor immediately notes that Alexandria looks at her the way a tattletale does sometimes, and she opens up talking about threats immediately or something bigger than threats, certainties. Yeah, so when I was tweeting about this on my live tweet, I got a pushback and I, I apologize, I can't remember who it was, but uh, the, about the fact that Alexandria can't find the word that works in this situation. She says it doesn't exist. Um, and you use certainties, which seems like a word that would work pretty well in here. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like this whole conversation is just her posturing. Like, I think she could have totally found a word that fits, but saying there isn't even a word for how sure I am when I make this threat sounds a lot scarier than it's a certainty. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. I think, um, I think she's, putting on her own her own image her own uh, bad cop routine of of being maximally scary and just kind of i mean like it, it's interesting to me because her um like especially in the audiobook the the person who kind of does her 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 reading comes off as really kind of um mustache twirlingly villainous which, so so that's kind of oh, how really? i end up huh. yeah like I, I know that's that's not necessarily how I read it in my head when I was reading that scene, but like no, the like the that speech in particular, um, the 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 floridness of her words and just like she seems so like at ease as she's kind of like pontificating on like English doesn't have the right word for it, and it's like this is she's making these extremely dire threats while being so like 
sort of detached in, in the way she's talking about things. Um, I think that's definitely supposed to be scary. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, the certainty she wants to convey is that she's going to put an end to all this. This conversation uh, will happen later when things are more stable. Yeah, that's like the most ominous thing to say ever. Yeah. So from the outside, uh, from the outside, it's just complete hardball. There's no opening for negotiation. Your team is now my bargaining chip, she says. And um, just a little, little beat here where Costa Brown consistently refers to Alexandria as a separate person. <laughs> um, and she uh, she says Alexandria will be departing in five minute intervals to take out the undersiders one at a time until she's taken them all out. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to say that this strategy is enormously fucked up <laughs> um, yeah like i think like even even with what we learn later like w- as we learn what her real plan was it's still pretty fucked up um but as we know it right now it's it's just straight up awful and it, it, more importantly it's very specifically not a heroic thing to do it's not what we've come to understand t- the definition of hero to mean not specifically in the parahuman world but just like the english definition of the word hero in these kinds of stories um that's not heroic alexandria here is absolutely a villain even if she doesn't have the the sweatshirt that says yeah i think we have miss militia there to act as a as a contrast and because we see her struggling with this behavior the whole time and 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 this is what the beat that we hinted at earlier that we we have uh danny uh say alexandria is going to be killing innocent children without a trial or not innocent children rather but children without a trial um but alexandria replies that she will just be acting in self-defense if it comes down to it which is complete and utter bullshit (laughs) um like in vulnerable alexandria killing an undersider is as much self-defense as taylor carving out eyes was like not very it's complete bullshit right i'm I'm going to attack them and if they defend themselves then then I'm justified in whatever I do. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. Which in actuality so, is like her entire plan with Taylor. Yeah. Right. So she waits to hear Taylor out, uh, but Taylor won't offer anything. So Alexandria takes the opportunity to talk about her reputation a bit, a reputation that was forged through her accomplishments. Her other power, she says is greater than her strength and invulnerability, her memory, her mind. Yeah. And of course this is her just, Continuing that narrative of utmost confidence is all cause. She's she's kind of representing this thing about authority that Taylor hates the most, um, almost as if she's like trying to spur her into action or something. Yeah, almost as if she's provoking her. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, so Taylor offers uh, that Tattletale can help solve the problems Cauldron has been working on, but Alexandria doesn't want to share the information that they do have with anybody else, so she doesn't take that offer. Yeah, which I, I mean, as much as I think Alexandria is awful here. It makes a kind of sense, though. Um, like, a, the girl called Tattletale isn't exactly the most trustworthy person to be, like, sharing information you want to keep secret with. Yeah, right. Like, if, if Cauldron wanted to use Tattletale's powers, then you kind of think that they would have done so already. Yeah. They, they wouldn't need it to be offered to them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's 545. So, Alexander goes to grab an undersider. And at this point, Miss Militia essentially storms out of the room she's like i need some air um and i think she's having a hard time with this yeah because she's the only one of these damn people who's a hero on the hero side yeah um yeah it's it's so like i love how transparent it is how upset she is she clearly like hates alexandria there's that beat like you made us call her like i'm mad at you because you made us involve her um and and she hates alexander she hates the plan but her hands are tied and she doesn't know what to do and you just feel for her yeah, definitely. So in, in Alexandria's absence, Tag continues to antagonize her, telling her that she's going to get the death penalty. Meanwhile, um, she is using her bugs to dial Tattletail's cell phone number on the phone in Tag's office. And then she communicates to Tattletail through phone beeps. <laughs> so the idea of a bug like rearing back and smashing into a phone number to communicate to Tattletail is just hilarious to me that I can't help but laugh at it. Yeah. Um but I wonder, so here's, here's like, I love this chapter. I love it so much. The using the bugs to communicate to Tattletail beat of it is the one thing I don't love. Um, it, it just feels unnecessary to me. And like, I, I get, I get the intent is to give Taylor something active to do. So she's not just sitting there unable to do anything, 
but I kind of like the idea of her just sitting there unable to do anything. Um, I like it a lot more and I kind of wish it was just that instead of having this, this beat where she's trying to communicate via a phone. It just feels like it's not necessary to me. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I guess, uh, the fact that she doesn't really accomplish anything is, is, is there, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I, I always, I always just thought it was fun how, Telltale is able to know what she means just by listening to beep, boop, beep, beep. Yeah, I mean, it, um, it is. I just, I, I don't know. I, if it had actually accomplished something, maybe. Um, I, I just, I, 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 like, we're trying to get her in an isolated place where she's desperate. She doesn't know what to do. She's trapped. Um, and, like, I, I just, I think, I think that beat lands a little more if you don't have this phone device. Yeah, or like maybe if she had tried to do it and it didn't work yeah. or, or couldn't get past the security yeah. system or something like that. But that's like yeah. that's like a very minor complaint about yeah. this, the masterwork that is this entire chapter. So Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So yeah, eventually uh, Alexandria returns and t- at this point Taylor notes that Miss Militia is still not here because she's leaning over the railing of a helicopter pad just staring at the city and having her own moral, <laughs> moral crisis in the background. Um <laughs> And Alexandria doesn't have anybody with her, but she says that the person she captured will be arriving in a PRT truck. Yeah, I'm glad you're pointing out the Miss Militia moments, really, because that, that they are the moments that got me a lot throughout this, yeah. that seeing how visibly upset she was at this whole thing. Right. So Taylor realizes that Alexandria is cold reading her, and uh, Alexandria admits that she is. And then the PRT band shows up with Regent, unconscious, tranquilized, an arm and a leg badly broken. And Alexandria gives Taylor another chance to cooperate or she'll go get the next undersider. Yeah. As much as I knew that this was a story and I forgot the rules of story for a second here <laughs> and was just like, well, they're screwed. Don't know how everyone's going to get out of this one. It's over. Yeah. Um, it's really, I mean, the, the hopelessness of the situation is constructed very well. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, you've, you've spent this whole time, this whole story really building up this hero as Superman almost, you know, like yeah. she's, 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 lit- she's not, perfect um and, and it's interesting to actually think through if if she had actually gone on after the undersiders like Gru versus her would actually be fairly alarming because Gru could take her power yeah you know, you've got two enrolled people but yeah i mean it's um it's uh yeah like you said so yeah uh taylor at this point describes this process as extortion which <laughs> alexandria doesn't bother to d- deny at all and tells her that she's and, and Taylor tells her that she feels that she's being backed into a corner. Um, but but yet she says, I'm not making concessions. The terms I made still stand. And uh, both women are waiting for the other to budge an inch and neither will. Yeah. And I think Alexandria comes out here as like the super powered version of Tag. Like she does have her own reasons just like Tag. Um, but she's she's refusing to budge. She's pushing and prodding. Um, we very specifically were learned why she's doing this later. But in this moment, I think you're just begging for someone to budge on something. It's like someone just just compromise, <laughs> like someone yeah. do something. Yeah, it's extremely effective. Yeah. So Taylor considers giving Alexandria some information about the undersiders that she can use to capture them without hurting them too badly. But she refrains, deciding that that would be a betrayal. Yeah, and it is really kind of amazing how quickly things have gone from Taylor seemingly have having control of this situation um, that that forcing the protectorate and the PRT into a situation where there's no right answer. Um, just, just a series of bad ones. And now Alexandria has really flipped that situation around completely. Now Taylor's forced into a situation where she has no right answer. Um, that's just a bunch of bad choices that, um, all end in badness. And Taylor does not like feeling like that at all, as we know. Yeah. So at this point, um, Danny steps outside with Kaye and, uh, Taylor listens in on him getting a crash course in being a supervillain's dad. Meanwhile, Tag is just kind of acting like a jerk in the room with her, making pointless noises, invading her space, pushing all of her buttons. Yeah, because we can't, we, we, Alexandria can't piss her off the entire time. We need to take turns. Yeah, right. The, I think the Danny moments here is some of the tension releasing moments of the chapter, though. Um, like, there's kind of this comedic relief with him desperately attempting to understand, like, what being the father of a supervillain means yeah. um and I, I i like it It it's it's necessary here i think because this is just a tense as hell chapter yeah yeah so alexander returns holding imp next 
She flies down and she puts Imp in a cell and eliminates the bugs in the room. And then when Alexandria shows up again with Miss Militia this time, she's soaking wet. It looks like she went up against Ligeia. Um, and we're reminded that Alexandria can drown. Oh, oh, are we? Are we reminded that? Well, Alexandria says they tried to drown me. <laughs> yeah. Alexandria very specifically reminds her that that is her weakness. Yeah. It's like Others Superman walking it. into a room and being like, ah, kryptonite, definitely the thing that can kill me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, others have tried to use kryptonite in the past. Yeah. So at this point, uh, Taylor is freely thinking of Alexandria as a bully in her, in her mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, here we go. This is the B word for, for Alexandria and, and tag both. Now they're bullies for acting like jerks and, and throwing around their power to try to throw Taylor off balance. Um, this, this opinion of hers, of course, completely ignores the fact that that's the very thing Taylor has been doing since she got here, since she turned herself in. But, um, when she's against it, Taylor tends to lash out. Yeah, no, that's that's not relevant, Scott. Uh, so finally, Alexandria makes an offer, a concrete offer with practically nothing Taylor asked for, uh, which Taylor rejects. Yeah, and, and it's almost as if that offer is so bad that Alexandria wants Taylor to reject it. Um, and... and <laughs> Like in this moment, like you see that like Taylor's father and Miss Militia are begging her to take this deal, begging her to back down. Don't escalate Taylor, but she won't. She she can't. Yeah. And, and we find out later that this is like a con. But right in, in that moment, I didn't I thought it was just Alexandra being like, look, here is the most minuscule compromise that I'm going to offer. And then I really am just going to go take your team apart and then you're going to have nothing. And then you're going to go to the birdcage. So just take this and, and, and like, but, but you're right that, that actually she, I think she knows enough of Taylor's psychology to know that she's not going to take this and it's just going to push her closer to that edge that they're seeking. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's, it's clever. It, it really is. I mean, I think, I think all this, like Alexandria's extreme confidence throughout this entire interaction is like key to everything that happens at the end of this chapter working the way it does. So I think we're hitting this beat of just how confident she is. Like everything she's done, everything she said, like she's like almost to a point where you're starting to be like, damn, like is, is this overconfidence going to be her weakness? Like, and it, it ends up being so. Yeah. Um, so like all these beats are so important. Yeah. So, so here I, I like this little speech that Alexandria gives where she's, she's basically connecting with Taylor while reinforcing the idea of, of kind of loving your teammates and, and talking about how she loved the other uh, protectorate members. And she actually includes Meriden in this list, which I think was somewhere in my mind when I said that Meriden had a close relationship with these other folks. Um, and, and, and she basically talks, yeah. talks about the, the bonds of being team teammates with them. And, and Taylor says, don't compare us, uh, which is which is ironic because that's, <laughs> that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she says, and you learn to look past their faults, the little evils, she said, and they learn to look past yours. That's isn't that so true, though? Like, that's such a biting thing. Yeah. And it's like it's not only is it great writing, but it's wonderful characterization because Alexandria knows exactly what she's doing here. And she's she's attacking Taylor in a, a truthful way. She knows Taylor's situation with these guys. She knows what type of people they are. But she also knows that Taylor considers them friends and loved ones. And and so she's she's targeting this attack to specifically hit her weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. So Taylor still won't back down until her team gets amnesty. And Alexandria jumps on this. She says, oh, OK, amnesty. Fine. We'll we'll give them the amnesty and the deal will be done and, and, we'll, and we'll, this will be over with. And Taylor feels tempted, perhaps. And, and her dad really wants it to happen. He's, he's holding her hand. Um, and, and I think this is one of those moments where you're like, yes, okay, Taylor, I mean, just accept something or, or, or meet her halfway or something. And instead she just rejects it completely with, with like her villainous, you know, harshness that she's cultivated and finishes off with like, I'll come after you. Like it came after butcher, like it came after coil Calvert. Um, and Alexandria is just like, all right, and pieces out to go grab another undersider. Yeah, but how unhinged does the show 
that Taylor is now because yeah. like even Miss Melissa just says you're admitting to it like that like we had this whole beat arcs ago where she said like she was like I'm not saying I did kill Coyle I'm not saying I didn't like she's dancing around yeah. admitting it um, and now she just doesn't care anymore she doesn't care about anything yeah it's yeah just she's crazy. just just trying to portray this this ruthless villain image to the extent that it is no longer a portrayal yeah this is actually who she is now i mean I'm, I'm i'm sorry like i can't i can't i can't see it any other way than that like she's she's just acting authentically to who she is because this militia asks her like why didn't you accept it and and she she says it's because it would be a betrayal of the undersiders but that's not the real reason is it matt and and at least she admits to herself not out loud but to herself what the real reason is and i love I love this quote. I love it so much. She said to 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 take the deal would be um, to do what she's done for so long before she had her powers for months after she had her powers to capitulate, to let go of my pride, to let them win those people who wanted to use their power, their prestige and their superiority against me. She can't do it. It's not even about the deal anymore. It's about letting them win. Yeah. Like they have backed her into a corner. They have pushed her against the wall. She's not in control of the bargaining anymore, so she can't accept it, even if it's the thing she wants. I mean, we literally have a moment where she's like, I'm sorry, I can't accept anything that doesn't have the amnesty. Oh, okay, well, here's the amnesty. No, I, sorry, no, no. Yeah. And it's just like, it's it's not even about the deal anymore to her. Yeah, that that was a, that, that interaction right there was a huge moment because because they're basically calling her on it. They're calling yeah. her on, on like, okay, okay, heroic skitter, you know, you're putting forth this this offer compromise with us that that's your compromise. And not only is she like, no, she's like, no. And if you harm another hair on their head, I'll kill you. And, and, and just goes completely full, <laughs> yeah, full Heisenberg on her. Um, yeah. so I, I think that's one of the more telling beats in the whole arc. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the PRT van, uh, finally arrives after, after Alexandria leaves this time and there are no precautions set up. There's only a body bag in the van and based on its shape and size, Taylor deduces that it must be either Rachel or Brian. And it's weird to say that I was kind of hoping it was Brian here. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I like Brian, but I love Rachel. And like I was telling myself at this moment that Alexandria was rounding them up in the same order that Taylor said goodbye to them, even though there's, there's only been two people and there's really not any kind of uh, long enough pattern to dis discern any pattern recognition from it. But I wanted to believe it so bad that I just decided and convinced myself that that's what was happening. Um, so I was like, OK, it's Brian. It's fine. It's Brian. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is a weird thing to say. But yeah, I don't remember exactly what my reaction was, but I think I was like almost doing exactly what Ta Taylor does later where she's like. When I was when I was concerned that it was Brian, or like when I thought it might be Brian, I consoled myself that it probably wasn't. That, it, but when I thought it was Rachel, I cons I consoled myself that it was probably Brian. Yeah, yeah. and it's just like like keeping yourself in this Schrodinger's cat situation. So yeah, at this point, she goes cold and she starts shaking, and the tears begin just as Alexandria flies closer. The moment she stops flying. Taylor's swarm drives straight into her mouth and down her throat. Spiders reach her lungs before she can stop it from happening. And she's been bringing deadly bug bugs into the room this whole time. And she immediately viciously attacks Tag with them. Eyes, eardrums, mucous membranes. And she says, I told them, warned them. And Alexandria tries to fly away. And Tag knocks Danny down and smashes Taylor's head against the table. And she's tranquilized. And she re refrains from calling the bugs off of him as she passes out. Oh boy. Yeah. And she thinks as she's passing out, I'd promised myself I wouldn't let the bullies win again. I thought that I'd stop the monsters, but the thought sounded disconnected. False. No, this was revenge. Something simpler than any of that. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, um, I loved this so much. I, I think I think we, you and I have talked about how there's a segment of the fan base that had a problem with how this all played out. Um, I do not. I think it is wonderfully set up. 
Um, especially the more we learn about what Alexandria was trying to do here, the more and more what happens makes sense to me. Um, but uh, the thing I really want to talk about is that moment at the end there, that um, a- at the end of all this, she tries to do the same thing she's always done. She tries to find a way to justify this. And in that moment, she can't. She she Her compartments have fallen to the point where she knows it's not true. And she admits to herself that this was all about revenge. And we talk about, you know, when you cross that line the first time, how much easier it becomes for you to cross it again. And I think if we look at the murders, the deaths that Taylor has been responsible for, we see that the first one took about, what, 16 arcs to happen? Um, yeah. The second one, about five more after that, if we're, we're looking at Butcher as, as a, a death that she was involved in. And the third one, uh, one more arc after that. These are these are coming faster now. And it's because each time you do it, it gets a little easier to do it more. So much so that she doesn't even need to rationalize and justify it to herself even more. She can admit the, the true purpose behind it. And yeah. that's what we've been talking about. That this, this, like, this, that this is what we were leading to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, you really could talk about just this moment for for like a really, really long time. And I mean, this is one of the most like sort of famous moments in the story. And it's something that people do talk about a lot. Um, cause, cause you can also just take it for its sheer narrative awesomeness. Like, because, cause really what you, we, we on this, on this show, we tend to track Taylor and her sort of character arc and her sort of downfall and her sort of, um, um, failure to live up to her ideals in in many cases but even if you're just reading the story as like escapist fun which is a completely legitimate way of reading it i I still think um like this this works as like your your protagonist who 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 you like and whose corner you're in having all of her options taken away from her being put in the most dire situation um and, and feeling that tension ramped up and up and then pulling this incredible like vicious victory out of out of nowhere um and and it feeling somehow completely earned but also tragic and it's it's this wonderful mix of i think that's what i find so striking about it is like it's not like she's defeating um a straight up villain. She's defeating Alexandria, who is basically, as we've said, her, but a little bit older and, and with different parameters. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's this like, it, it is this, it is this victory, but where, where you, you want, you want her to win. You want her to get out of the situation, but also it's like, well, not, not like this though. This is, this is painful. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's yeah. very complicated. It, it's victory at at what cost, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's that's uh, the the next chapter is us basically just dealing with the the, the fallout of this whole thing, um, and it, it's yeah. really great. And you're right. It, like you can you get like antihero type stuff does this all the time, where it, it forces you to want to root for the 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 person you're following, and you do, but you also have to track what this means for who they are in the long run, and this means something for who Taylor is going to become. Um, yeah. This is a big deal. Um, th- this is what has been leading to that. That not only has she now, like she started off killing, killing coil um, who is a monster and Alexandria is not a good person. Like she, she's not, but she's not like a hundred percent evil either. And I think there there's that's, that's intentional that now we've moved on to killing this person and, and what, what, what is next? Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Slippery slope. So, yeah, it's interesting. My brain remembers this arc ending there. <laughs> well, we've been going for like an hour and forty-five minutes, so, yeah. and we're halfway through the arc. So, yeah, right. That's the, it. Always surprises me yeah. to remember that this that that happens in kind of the middle of the arc. Actually, to be fair, I think it's pretty heavily front-loaded, like as far yeah. as our page count goes. Yeah, yeah. So 22.5 starts up and Taylor wakes up realizing that she has been a monster and that she is a monster. That's how she's, that's her first perception of this. 
Um, but fairly quickly, she kind of goes into battle mode and, and she starts, you know, canvassing her, her surroundings. And she also notices that her few remaining bugs have been weaving silk cords in her sleep. Um, <laughs> yeah. She thinks, uh, I was pretty sure I hadn't given that order, which left only three real possibilities. Either my unconscious mind had willed it while I, sl- while I slept or my passenger had unnerve it, uh, unnerving. More unnerving was the third possibility that there wasn't a real distinction between my unconscious mind and the, and the passenger. Right. row. <laughs> yeah. So she's back in her cell. Uh, there are no people at all in her range and, uh, she's got her hands in these heavy duty cuffs. So she decides she needs a PRT phone to get out of her cell. She finds Tag's body in the morgue, but she can't bring herself to feel too bad about having killed him. Even though she knows that he had daughters, he's still a bully. He's still a threat to her somehow. Oh, Taylor. Yeah. Oh. So she uses her bugs to bring Tag's phone and keys toward her, dealing with a series of obstacles as she goes. Before she can finish, though, D- Dragon and Defiant arrive, and she cribs the phone code from Defiant and uses it on Tag's phone to open her cell door. This is just terrible IT security. I need to get some smarter security people in here, stat. <laughs> should not have one universal code that works on every device. It's insane. <laughs> well, you know, that's what she's saying. We need a new PRT. <laughs> well, there you go. That's uh, totally Team Taylor now. Everything she does is great. Yep. So she tries to escape, evading and second-guessing the actions of the two heroes. She gets the cuffs off and starts making a silk rope and manually trapping Kids Wind's drones. Um, she realizes the dragon can detect her movements through the security system, so she has the bugs kill the power. And then she steals a grenade launcher, but seems uh, the grenade launcher seems to detect that she isn't authorized. Finally, Defiant catches her and pins her, and she finds she can't hear the two talking to each other. Yeah, and Matt, this is kind of a very... Uh, different kind of chapter pace wise. Um, and I think it's because we're in this aftermath of that terrible thing that Taylor did. And it got me thinking, you know, like in movies where after a grenade goes off or they do it in Saving Private Ryan a lot when there's like a loud explosion and you hear that loud ringing noise and everyone is kind of moving sluggishly and confused. Um, this is a chapter that feels like that for the entirety of it. Like that, that Taylor is just like, reeling from this thing she did and she's confused and things are she's like struggling and and still trying and everything's kind of moving in slow motion and like she's she's trying to solve her way out of a problem while a little concussed and it just feels like her capture is inevitable but she she has to keep trying anyway yeah yeah i feel like in her mind as long as she's still fighting then none of the things that have happened will have a chance to hit her yeah which I think is valid because pretty much the next thing that happens is Dragon and Defiant grab her and they carry her up to the roof. And now that she's kind of under their control and she doesn't really have a lot of options, she's no longer able to dissociate like that and the emotions start to catch up to her. Yeah, and her, her bugs are mostly gone too, right? She she doesn't have that tool for disassociating anymore. Um, and that's that's a visual representation of her compartmentalization that is gone and she's kind of forced to deal with everything and she does not take it well yeah but but she still doesn't stop she's still desperate so she she does this trick where she ties the two heroes together and then she requests to talk to define alone and then when dragon walks away um it jerks defiant away from from her and, and she almost gets away there um basically trying to do everything she can to kill him yeah and and this is i think what worm uh, can do when it's it's at his absolute best arms master has been this guy that was the original jerk <laughs> of the story um he was like the first time we met a hero he was an asshole to taylor we didn't like him from the get-go neither did she he doubled down on his assholeness every time they interacted but we see defiant and and defiant has really really tried to change like you guys the listeners gave me so much shit for being mistrusting of dragon at first um, and I, I see why now, because she has this this good influence on Defiant and to see Taylor abuse and manipulate this new person who's trying to be better, like makes you angry. Like I got mad at her and I never thought I would get mad at someone being mean to arms master. Yeah, right. And, and when he says, St- stop that, stop trying things Ugh. like you, you read it, it reads as like comedic and and you're on his side there you're like you're like yeah yeah really <laughs> um which yeah. is which, which is like you said you're not used to feeling like you're on his side no that's i mean that's a, it's a wonderful quote like stop that just stop 
stop trying things like stop. And it's just like, it's, it's defiant saying it, but I think us, the reader are kind of saying it too at this moment. It's just like, Taylor, Taylor, you have to stop. You just have to stop. And it's, yeah. it's a really great moment. Yeah. And, and, and here he tells her that tag and Alexandria are both dead and he condemns Taylor for killing somebody that the whole planet depended on, even though he understands that she was pushed to it. Yeah. And, and, and now we suddenly see Taylor attempt to compartmentalize again. Um, and when, when defiant calls tag a family man, she calls him a bully and then says twisted by the sea merg probably, which where did the fuck did that come from? <laughs> like yeah. she has no basis for that ever. She's just grabbing for straws and reaching for anything she can um, to, to kind of uh, make herself understand what she did. And, and I really, I really do like in this moment that defiant is very understanding of what she just went through and what she did. Um, like they did escalate the situation. They did push her. They did force her into this situation where she felt like she had to lash out on it. And the fact that defiant is understanding of that means he kind of maybe sees a little bit of himself in her in this moment. And, like is understanding of that and is trying to help her, but you won't stop trying things. It's yeah. really great. Yeah. So, so here though, we kind of get, you know, that twist that we've been referencing where this militia comes in over the speakerphone and we realize that there was this plan in the works and Taylor realizes that the fact that the undersiders haven't attacked yet means that Alexandria wasn't really going after them. She was pulling a trick on her. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, uh, 22.6 begins and we, and then we understand what that trick was. The three protector at capes all know how Alexandria operates and they know, uh, what she was doing. So, so basically, um, uh, Alexandria and, and kind of some of the other people present, uh, either like wanted Taylor to attack so that they could just put Taylor away or they wanted her to break, which, you know, was seemingly what they were trying to do on the surface. Um, and that the undersiders bodies that she saw were all body doubles. Yeah. And, and I wanted to talk about that choice for a minute. Cause like it could have just like, it could just as well have actually been the undersiders story wise. Right. Like he, like that, that would have, that would have worked. So I wanted to talk about that decision. Yeah, I, you're absolutely right. It would have worked just fine. And I think from, from Alexandria's perspective, it would have still gotten, Taylor to the place that she wanted her to go um but i love that it wasn't because like taylor has been like constantly operating by the assumption that everything that she does is a necessary thing that even the bad thing she does is necessary you know killing coil killing butcher uh sac even sacrificing herself was necessary for the greater good and but by making it so that the undersiders were never actually in danger were never actually threatened um the the one that she thought was dead Rachel or, or dead Brian were, were not actually those people. Taylor's thin justification, her, her revenge justification is that is even taken from her. Um, it, it's, it's revenge from nothing. And it, it, I think it really like gets Taylor to a place where, where maybe she's finally, finally, finally willing to cooperate a little bit with the PRT. Yeah. Maybe. Although it does help that that tag the guy that she hated the most has been <clears throat> removed from the equation. Yes, it certainly simplifies things. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that I'm I'm glad that you framed it that way because for me it almost sort of took the punch away from what we just witnessed. That you then find out it wasn't really the undersiders. Um, but 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 I, I you're exactly right. If we if if she basically killed someone for no reason, she has to face the fact that um, she's highly fallible, obviously. Yeah. And and you can't just go around executing your own vision of justice on people because you don't always know what's going on. Yep. Yeah. So the he the heroes want to control the PR implosion that's going to be coming in 14 minutes when the undersiders att attack, which they're still planning to. So Taylor now thinks that the PRT should just burn, though, because she's well, frankly, just because she's really emotional at this moment. <laughs> um, Miss Militia calls her out on this and uh, basically points out that this is just anger, um, and she wants Taylor to call off the undersiders, and Taylor demands that the undersiders get their amnesty in exchange. 
Yeah, I, I, Taylor like is literally just calling for anarchy at this point. Like she goes on this rant about how any system that has people in it is screwed because people are just terrible and she just wants to tear it all down. Um, it's really great. Like it shows she's trying to deal with the things that she just did and kind of losing it, losing it. And like, I love that she, as part of this anger, she gets m- mad at Miss Militia for not doing anything. And I think Miss Militia's response is perfect. Um, yeah. where she just says, you can't blame me for standing out of the way. You had a plan. Alexandria told me she had a plan and nobody shared anything substantial with me. I couldn't take a step without risking that I get in someone's way. And it's like, everybody's got all these damn secret plans and they don't tell me anything. And I didn't know whose plan I would be hurting if I did something or whose yeah. I wouldn't. And then nobody tells me anything. <laughs> it's this wonderful moment. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, I think that's great. I mean, just like objectively in, in like my multiple rereading and analysis mode, Taylor is like the least sympathetic that she's ever been right here because she's, she's just kind of throwing all of her own ideals under the bus here. She's like, I don't, I don't care if there's open warfare and capes die and the city is ruined by the obviously giant battle that's going to happen. Um, I, I just think the PRT should burn and, 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 uh, and I'm willing to sacrifice all of this to get the amnesty for my, for my small group of villain friends. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So the heroes, uh, determine that Miss Militia will be put in charge as she's chief director of the new PRT. So Taylor gets that. Um, then Taylor calls Tattletail to try to call off the attack, temporarily at least. She communicates to Tattletail that she did indil- indeed kill Al- Al- Alexandria, to which the, the Undersiders react with their usual grace and maturity. <laughs> Classic Undersiders. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love their reaction. It's really, yeah, I mean, right. like, to be fair, though, I think anyone would react that way. It's like, yeah. She just killed fucking Alexandria. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I like that that Imp and Imp and, Re- and Regent are both like think it's hilarious in the typical way. <laughs> yeah. And Gru Gru is just like, like disturbed. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just yeah. Disturbed is exactly the right word. Yeah. So next she calls uh, Kaye, and uh, he won't actually agree to make any concessions unless he's present. So they send the Dragoncraft to get him. They also want her to be at the press conference that they're about to hold and to participate in the narrative in order to legitimize it. Taylor's not happy that the new beginning will be based on lies, but she can't reasonably demand anything further. Yeah, and this is, I think, where we're seeing that shift in her, that that she's she's starting to realize that sometimes that kind of deception is, is a necessary evil, um, and it's a necessary evil in the same way that some of the decisions she's made in the past have been necessary evils and she's starting i think maybe for the first time to understand the prt a little bit and to understand the things that they have to go through and i think it's it's because of defiant really i think it's because of defiant because of dragon because of miss militia these people being around her in this moment that allows her to finally get there yeah i think you're right um and yeah so taylor can't help but compare this moment to the first time she met Arms Master, and, and this gives her the idea that they should frame the situation as Alexandria having been a villain. A.K.A. telling the truth, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> what a novel yeah. concept. The With truth. a twist. Yeah. With a twist. With a very big twist. <laughs> So Dragon shows her a drawer with something surprising in it, something that almost takes the wind out of her. Uh, did you have any guess what it was? Nope. Uh, yeah. She mentions Tinkers, and she complains about Tinkers again, so I thought it was some kind of device or something that would help them find cauldron or something. Uh, in retrospect though, I guess it's pretty obvious, but no, at the time, no. Okay. So Ch- Chevalier shows up too, and the protectorate capes head with Taylor to the press conference held on the wing of a dragon craft. Chevalier starts speaking, giving the stage managed story. The narrative is that it's sad that Alexandria is dead, but th- that she was a traitor and her treachery has torn the protectorate apart. Uh, Taylor detects the undersiders approach in a van as this is happening, but they're staying well back. Oh no. Oh no. My heart, Matt. I don't know if I can take this. So Chevalier uh, includes a lie that Alexandria had been corrupted by the Seamurg and that it was a concerted effort between the protectorate capes and Skidder that killed her. Isn't the Seamurg just like a really convenient catch all excuse for totally fucking people over? Yeah. uh, Taylor tried to use it as an excuse for why she killed Tag. And now, now this it's like, no, no, it's okay. Cause the Seamurg. It's fine. Yeah, right. So now it's Taylor's turn to speak, but she finds that she can't remember her lines. 
So Chevalier covers for her, skips ahead, and uh, they show off the many new fancy dragon suits, and they talk about the portal and the hope it represents. Taylor slips out of her prison sweats, and we see her new costume, her hero costume that she wears under it. She, she, she slips on her mask, and she gives her speech. She gives it to the undersiders. She had everything she could have wanted, but there are bigger things. She believes in the new PRT. As she speaks, the dogs begin to howl. And she finishes, when and if I do, you can call me Weaver. Dun, dun, dun. So let's talk about this forever. Okay. Um, I don't know what to talk about first. <laughs> There's so much going on here. Um, I want to talk about the, the imagery first, I guess. The beautiful imagery of the scene where, where Taylor is literally shedding clothes that have the word villain written on it um, to reveal the hero underneath all of it. Um, it's beautiful imagery and it's ironic imagery because we are at the moment at a time where Taylor is the least heroic that she has ever been and now has adapted a, a heroic name and persona. Um, and I think that's very intentional and I like that a lot. Yeah. But, but this is, this is what she's wanted right? this whole time, you know, right. and, and that's, that's. That, that's really interesting to talk about like the kinds of tension that you can create in a story because obviously it's fun to watch her win and win and win as yeah. the undersiders boss and, and, and kingpin of the city. But like that's not making her happier at all. In fact, it's making right. her miserable in, in many ways um, and making her life worse if anything. And you like we, we, we know her character so well, we're in her head so closely that that this is so much more satisfying than conquering the city. Throwing it all away for the sake of what she really wants, what's really right for her, is what's satisfying. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, th- and that, that moves into the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is this sudden willingness of her to compromise after all that she's gone through, after all that she's done in this entire arc, suddenly she's now she's totally on board with the compromise. Um, and I think the reason why that is, is because it's not actually her compromising anything. Um, she gets everything that she wanted. She gets amnesty for the undersiders. She gets tag removed from the PRT. Uh, she handled that one herself. Miss Militia's in charge. Um, she will be employed by the PRT in some way. I think they say that she might go to prison for a little while, but then when she comes out, uh, if she's able to, she will be a member of the protectorate or a ward or, or whatever. Um, Taylor gets everything here and gives up very little. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's good in terms of storytelling because it would be unrealistic for her to have like, like nothing happened here that would cause her to change fundamentally in this right. moment. Maybe she will change fundamentally on the basis of these events, but it's, it hasn't been enough time for that to sink in. I don't think, no, but yeah. what, what we're getting here is we're getting the satisfaction of her throwing away her, her past and embarking on a new path. Even if she's still the same flawed person, she has the same character flaws that she's had all along. Now, at least those are going to be challenged and, 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 and put in the right context, right? I mean, if, if we, of course, assume that she's going to try to be a hero now, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be hard for her because her, her instincts are villainous instincts. You know, we've, we've yeah. seen, or at least what she's learned how to do is, is villainy. Um, yeah. And I, I think that, I think that's like, that's what I was trying to say with my, you know, this is the moment that she declares herself a hero is, is actually the moment she's been, she's the least heroic in the yeah. story. I think that's intentional. And I think what that breeds is this, this real sense of hope for her um, for the first time in a while that, you know, she just did it's, it's, it's this lowest point for her, this point where she, she killed two people um, for motivations that weren't real um, in, in the midst of this, she finds a path that hopefully will set her towards some good event. And you're absolutely right that she is still that, that flawed person underneath, but hopefully she will be, in a situation where 
she can improve, that she's now doing the thing that, that she always set out to do, that she always wanted to do. It's like, I think it was last arc that we talked about where like, she was just like, I kind of accidentally took over the city. Like, like none of this was ever her idea. It was never her plan. She just kind of kept like, like she kept going forward like a shark. She couldn't stop. And, and, and finally she's got an opportunity to wipe that away and, and do what she wanted to do. Yeah. And so it's very hopeful um, as much as it, like I'm still concerned for her. I'm still concerned with, with the, the same traits that she's had throughout this story. But yeah, you leave this with like, maybe there's a way, maybe there's a way where she can get to a place where, she, where not only does she overcome the traumatic things that she's gone through, but she becomes a happier person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other, any other bits of that beat you want to talk about? Um, the howl, the heartbreaking yeah. howls. Um, yeah. It's beautifully timed. It's wonderful. Um, and, and, like we're going to see Rachel here in a second. And I never thought these were howls in anger or betrayal. Um, this always felt like Rachel was just devastated by the news. And I think we get confirmed that uh, in a bit. And it's really, it's really tragic and, and heartwarming and heartbreaking all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, as they're leaving, Defiant mentions that she can't stay here, uh, but bra- but Dragon just hug- hugs her and lets her cry. Yeah, okay, Dragon people, I get it now. I get it. <laughs> I still don't think you can fault me for mistrusting Dragon when we first learn who she is. Um, I, I think this, the novel is still intentionally setting up a level of distrust when you learn that she's an AI. But in this moment, I understand why you guys were so quick to defend her. Um, Taylor just went through hell Um, She just went through a a terrible, awful ordeal. Um, And and the only person that offers her kindness is the computer who gives her a robo hug. And it's beautiful, touching moment. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. We've I think at this point, Dragon has won everyone over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and we've seen what Dragon can do with Defiant. Like we've seen it in practice. We've seen how Defiant has become a better person. So in that moment when she's hugging her, you're like, yes. Like, like dragon is what Taylor needs right now. Maybe dragon can help her become the person that she wants to be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we're done with Taylor for now. So we go into 22 dot X and we are with Charlotte and the rest of Taylor's people reacting to the news of Taylor's surrender and, uh, and, and the, and the press conference. So Forrest has faith in her, but Charlotte isn't so sure. Yeah, I, I enjoyed this a lot. This beat where, where Charlotte wonders how much of a hero Taylor actually is that she's seen her at her absolute worst and, and she's seen how much she excelled in that role. Um, and I think this is kind of broadcasting that 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 bumpy road for Weaver that you hint, hinted at that um, that as she steps out to do heroic things, how well suited is she to actually do that? And and I think it's gonna be interesting. Yeah. So it turns out that she she has problems managing the children. They all have their own problems, their own traumas. Some of them are are fearful, or, or some are aggressive. And it's it's a cycle, Matt. It's all cyclical. Yeah. Um, uh, trauma, more trauma, more trauma. The best we can do is support these people and help them through the things they go through. Um, th- there's a lot of parenthood beats in this chapter. Um, we have Charlotte, and then we have Danny join in, and and it's really wonderful that we're talking about like how we help each other through trauma coming off the back of this moment where a dragon gives Taylor a hug. Yeah. Yeah. So she checks the pair of humans online forums and Taylor's fame has only grown now with this iconic, highly visible act being a strong villain who became a hero. Yeah. The, the, this is all great. But my favorite part about the exchange is when this Ben kid captures the essence of Taylor when he says, she was scary and mean, but she's not bad. And <laughs> she got us pizza. That's all that matters to me. And that's like Taylor. Like she's scary and mean, but she's not altogether bad. And she did get them food and help yeah. them. Yeah, that's her character in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah it that's, is. Uh, it's the topic sentence. So a reporter shows up. I'm wondering if this is Stan again and starts trying to dig up dirt on the kind of person Taylor was. Uh, is uh, they kick the reporters out, but some of the people in Taylor's territory start arguing that they shouldn't defend her. Yeah, if, if by some people, Matt, 
you you mean me <laughs> it's it's literally me let's let's look at this guy okay uh-huh. charlotte could see it was a tall man who'd hidden a receding hairline and bald spot by shaving his head there was only stubble now uh-huh. so he has a shaved head due to his bald spot me his yeah. name is scott also me yeah. and he's annoying all of the biggest skitter fans by being critical or unfair of her yeah matt also also tall also tall me Matt, yeah. uh, it's as if Wild Bo went back in time <laughs> and wrote me into this book. This was yeah. the weirdest thing to reread ever. I was like, yeah. wait, what? Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm surprised that this character didn't say why but at, at any point. <laughs> or reference Jean-Luc Picard. I mean, but, uh, maybe, it, maybe it was just off, off, uh, off book. Yeah, yeah. This must be Scott Bett. <laughs> You're probably right. Yeah. So, yes, um, Charlotte has a bit of a panic attack from this altercation and she runs into Danny as she flees and then she vets him to make sure he really is who he says he is um, via the phone with Telltale. Yeah, I love that panic attack moment, though, because it's this great reminder that Charlotte herself is still suffering from her own trauma. Um, She doesn't do well around crowds, especially as things seem to to start to turn violent and everyone everyone has issues. Everyone. Yep. Um. But Charlotte assures him that that Taylor is the same person that she always was, even though he's not so sure. Yeah, <laughs> he witnessed his daughter do this truly monstrous thing. And, and 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 I love that his reaction is to come here to her territory in this attempt to really understand her, because he, for the first time he thinks maybe I don't know who my daughter is anymore. So he let's go to where she lives and let's see if we can find out what's going on. Yeah, and he also kind of realizes like the magnitude of his delinquency as a parent because yeah, yeah. he's like, you know, I really probably could have been more proactive about all this. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So she leads Danny down the storm drain into the lair, and he sees the orphans that Taylor has been taking care of, and she listens to Charlotte's semi defense of her. Yeah, and there's a whole lot of like very subtle beats going on during all of this like danny is is seeing taylor's own kind of children that she through charlotte has been taking care of he's seeing the positive effects of her work the fact that a kid can go out at night and run an errand without being afraid of getting hurt um the fact that 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 same kid wants to help he wants to volunteer for those errands as a way to work through his own issues and and i love that little beat there where where danny says there's got to be a better way to handle this and Charlotte's response is, there probably is, but for now, this works for him and it works for me. And that's, I think, another pr- distillation of Taylor's, you know, point of view on things that has has bled into Charlotte a little bit here, that, that there might be a better way to do things. There might be a better way to save the world. But for now, this way is working. So we're going to yeah. do it. Right. And, and like... It's all well and good to say there may be a better way to do things, but th- that's right, but not what, obvious what, what that would be. Yeah, what are those? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, Danny, Danny's actually kind of still being a little bit crestfallen about all this because he, he, he can't really square what he's seeing with that person that he saw. Um, and and he, he really doesn't think it's – he really thinks she's, she's different now because – Taylor to him is someone who withdraws. Like that's her – that's a fundamental feature of her and what he saw – was this aggressive monster. Yeah. I, I think part of this is, is kind of pushing us to think about the passenger and maybe this as a passenger took over moment. But I think another part of it is just Danny just doesn't understand who his daughter is anymore. Just like legitimately like has been so absent from her life these past few months that just like, yes, she absolutely has changed. She is not that same little girl. She's not that same person that is, is going to withdraw. That's just not who she is anymore. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's completely alien to us to be like Taylor. I mean, Taylor is someone who withdraws yeah. emotionally. Yeah. As not she's physically, naming yeah. people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Danny is here. He basically says, like, he's not sure if he can vouch for her because uh, he's going to need to vouch for her for her to join the wards. And he's thinking maybe it would be better if she just went to juvie because uh, he's not sure if she should be doing this kind of thing. So what do you think? Do you think uh, do you think he should vouch for her? Yeah, I had all day to think about the answer to this question. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't I don't know. Like <laughs> like like the 
it, it all comes down to like this weird world that they live in because part of me as, as a, as a father would be like, why would I want my child to go do dangerous superhero battles when I could just have them safely in juvie? Um, but that's not really how it works either because like she's going to keep having her power no matter what, when she grows up, she's going to have her extremely dangerous power. So, so you have, you either like pipeline them into the, into the protectorate or you pipeline there or, or they basically become villains. That's kind of how it seems to turn out. Um, just, just kind of due to, due to lots of, lots of factors. Um, so I guess, I guess all things considered, you kind of have to put them in the ward where at least there's like a mentorship program type thing rather than just stalling the inevitable meltdown. Yeah. And I think it, it ties into the necessary evil of Alexandria and Idolan and, and legend, these people that lied and deceived everyone, but we still need them because there's bad shit in the world. So I think, yeah. I think the world needs Weaver Skitter. Um, and, and, and you're right. I think, Danny has to, in this moment, recognize, just like he did back in, in the PRT, that there's so much about this world and the things that are happening that he doesn't and can't understand. So he has to recognize what is his place and what isn't. And I think the world needs Weaver. And so I think he should. Yeah. I'm glad we're in agreement there. Yeah. So, yeah, Sierra uh, plus all the undersiders then show up at the base. Rachel has brought puppies to distribute as puppy therapy. So she if efficiently in a Rachel manner, distributes puppies as needed. Tattletale mentions that Rachel is probably hurting more than anyone. Oh my god. Oh my god. Rachel's just walking around handing people puppies. Are you hurting? Here, puppy. <laughs> yeah, right. She's uh, applying them like a medicine. Oh, it's so wonderful. Yeah. I loved it so much. Yeah, I have a very strong visual of this. Yeah. Telltale explains how the territory will be split between the other undersiders and how a ton of their money will be going toward rebuilding it. Uh, Danny communicates that Taylor refused to accept any deal that didn't protect the undersiders. Just a nice beach to let him know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we have this moment of, of, of Rachel saying, I haven't felt that way since Brutus and Judas, um, which doesn't mean anything to Charlotte, but we, we know what that means. Yes, we do. <laughs> um. And Rachel seems like she's going to decide that she will take the suggestion for her territory to be beyond the portal. Yeah, and I think this this shows just how rock solid uh, Rachel and, and Taylor's relationship has become here. It's very easy to see old Rachel as seeing this moment as a betrayal and being angry at Taylor and, and betrayed by Taylor. But that's this doesn't seem to be what she is. She's just hurt and she's not hurt because of betrayal. She's just sad because her friend's gone now. And she's not going to get to hang out with her friend anymore. And and that 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 causes her to want to be alone again, which is really the tragic moment is that finally she was becoming part of this pack. And her response is now I'm going to go off into portal world and be alone for a while. Yeah, and it's it's sad. Right. Yeah, I think it's just it's just loss is what yeah. she's feeling. Yeah. 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 So the undersiders leave um, the next morning. Aiden shows Charlotte a picture of a strange dream about planets and the stars. So now we have like potential trigger visions. Which I don't know what the hell that means. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and then we move into 22.y, which I was delighted because I forgot that this interlude was, was in this arc. So good. It's a good one. It's a good one. March 2nd, 1997. A group of young Japanese gang members, some of them parahuman, ambush a criminal business meeting. Our POV character is Kenta, a half-Japanese, half-Chinese kid with ambitions of joining the Yakuza. Yeah, and um, if, if I was remotely paying attention closely at this point when I first read it, I would have realized almost immediately that this is probably long. But when I read this on Sunday morning at 8 a.m., I was not paying close enough attention and did not. So... That's I okay. I figured this out at the trigger event moment. Not yeah, here. I, I think it. I think we figure it out pretty quickly. Yeah. So yeah, inside the room, we find some Chinese businessmen and the doctor and Contessa. The pair of human gangsters attack, but Contessa defeats them with whatever's lying around. Um, then she kills them all without shedding any blood, except of course Kenta, who triggers when she intentionally overdoses him on a brick of cocaine. So I sat for a while trying to find out how cocaine and lungs power like relates to each other. 
and I really couldn't come up with much of anything. Um, except I guess like he's physically addicted to the power that his power grants him, but he doesn't have control over it. So that's kind of like chasing a high, I guess, kind of, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I have like a vague sense that it's like, first of all, it probably had to, it, it had to be a brute factor because it was a physical violence, yeah. trigger. Yeah. Um, and it had to be something that would basically repair his body after a fatal overdose. Um, so that you got the regeneration there, but as, as for like the transformation, it could just be like, um, the, the ever escalating nature of the high that, that, that was killing him caused him to have this ever escalating physical transformation. That seems perfect. <laughs> All right, let's go with that. So Lung, uh, s- s- uh, uh, snap forward in time. Lung watches Leviathan tear the Japanese city apart. And he waits, letting his power grow within him, letting the transformation build up inside him. A Sentai woman speaks to him. And and at this point, he denies being a villain. He says, I am me. We see a lot of that kind of uh, labeling going on in this arc, don't we? Yeah. Like we have Dinah who says, I'm not good or bad. I'm just me. Um, Now we have Lung doing it. We have Skitter literally transforming from one to the other. I think it's kind of showing this, this fluid nature of these labels that we tend to want to yeah. pin to people so much. Yeah, and, and Alexandria going from being a a hero to being a villain. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. So Lung approaches transforming more and more, wreathed in flame and half transformed by the time he reaches Leviathan. The first blow from the Endbringer shatters Lung's body, but his transformation is too far underway and he heals from the wounds rapidly. By the time Lung joins battle with him again, he's able to grapple with the monster. He ch- changes more and more. He's half as big as Leviathan with longer bifurcated arms. Then he's bigger with wings, but his power feeds on challenge and he can't kill Leviathan. So his power deserts him. Yeah, I don't know what much to say about this other than this was really awesome. And it's really juicy information. We like There was always people wondering if Lung's power had limits. And it obviously does because eventually he's going to get to a point where he doesn't feel challenged anymore. And... Like when he feels like he can't win, then there's no point in being powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I think that's the, that's the incident where Leviathan destroyed the whole Island, right? Yeah. Yeah. Way to, way to piss him off. Right. Yeah. Good job. And he's, Lung's also really mad. I remember in that moment that no one saw him at his biggest, like Uh he was just alone there with Leviathan. So no one got to see him at his most intimidating. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. So three years later, um, turns out he's been bouncing between terrible prisons in China. He's in a deep pit and a prisoner of the young man. Uh, two numbered capes come down to talk to him, trying to get him to join their group. He tells them he'll join, but he clearly only plans on escaping. There's a weird. So <laughs> we're talking about like this idea of that. He is willing to do whatever he needs to do to accomplish his own goals. Yeah. Which, of course, echoes with a lot of our other characters and stuff. But this idea that he's willing to join a group, even though he knows he's going to escape, is kind of hard not to parallel that with what Skitter has just done. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the way it actually works out, but I, I think we're drawing a pretty direct parallel there. Yeah. Um, or or when she joined the Undersiders, yeah, for that matter. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then, flash forward again, he's in Brockton Bay giving a philosophical talk to Bakara. He tells her about the two kinds of fear, the fear of the uncertain and the fear of certainties. Uh, Maybe, hey, Scott, do you think maybe certainties isn't the (laughs) isn't the word? Maybe more like like a malediction or a curse. I like I am continually like amazed at how well (laughs) these setups pay off in this way and how well this stuff like coils back around on each other in that way. Like Uh it's it's so like it's just so fun to read, you know, like it's like they're like we love talking about the stuff. We love getting nerdy. And, and, but we sometimes forget just like, this is a fun book to read. And it's yeah. stuff like this. When you realize when you can see the dots connected between these things, it's just fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anything, we could spend more time talking about like the thematic coherence of each arc internally to itself and, yeah. and little, little echoes like this. Yeah. I'm sure people will say, please do that. But we're already <laughs> running really yeah. late. There's, there's a lot to talk about guys. Yeah. Um, and then we flash to, I suppose, the present and he's in the birdcage hanging out with teacher, Panacea and Marquis. 
as Panacea explains her theory of superpowers. Of course, we flash in right at the end of that yeah. discussion <laughs> instead right. of the part that I wanted yeah. to hear. Yeah, yeah, right. Burritos, Panacea finished. <laughs> um, yeah. So they watch the Weaver broadcast on TV, and basically this seems like an opportunity to remind us that Long sees Taylor as one of the people who have beaten him and wronged him. Yeah, he, he's got his Arya Stark list yeah. of people. Right. Um, that the Endbringers are not one of because he seems them like as pointless. Like, I can't beat them. It's There's no point to it. Right. Yeah. Teacher takes Long aside and makes him an offer. Apparently his power gives other people minor thinker powers and he wants to give Long the ability to control his transformation. The only cost is a temporary loss of willpower. Trickster taps the computer into a channel that talks to Saint, the Dragon Slayer leader. Or I think that's. I'm not entirely clear what the TV does, but something like that. Um, and teacher yeah. offers a deal that he'll get long out of the birdcage if he'll serve as a bodyguard. Oh, so do you mean that there's going to be like some sort of escape from the birdcage, Matt? No, I don't I know. can't be. I, I don't. I don't want to gloss over the the uh, trickster being like a lackey oh, with yeah, no lines yeah. in the scene. Yeah, it, it is like wonderful. Um, I think at anyone else's point of view, we might have heard Trickster speak, but Lung looks at him as so far down that, like, even if he did say anything, Lung probably wouldn't have even considered it enough right. to have the, the, the dialogue be here. That's funny. Yeah, I like that. All right, Scott, that was the infamous Arc 22 cell. Yeah. Oh, man, what a great one. I, I really yeah. liked it. Um, the, the interludes themselves aren't doing a whole lot. I think that's why we went through this last one pretty quickly. Um, there's stuff that happens in there and it's important world building stuff. And I think we're obviously positioning Lung to enter, uh, into the mix again. But, um, but uh, man, it's it just like uh, compared to the wonderfulness that was the main section of the arc this time around. Um, I, I'm glad we spent more time on that stuff cause it's so much, so much better. Yeah. I mean, this, this Lung interlude for me is, is like candy. And, and I've, I've, this is one of the interludes that I've reread a bunch of times. Um, but but mainly just because it's pure fun. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, the whole the whole description of the fight between Leviathan and, and Lung is really fabulous. Like, it's really yeah. great. All right, Scott, any, any speculations this week? Yeah, so we have some old ones um, we have to do first. Um, I said that Sierra will quit her job for Taylor, who will not take it very well. I mean, she's technically not working for her anymore, but that's because, like, she inherited millions of dollars worth of land in the name of the undersider. So I think that's close enough to being wrong for me to call it wrong. Yeah. I think it was wrong in spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> number two, I said, Dinah planned for Taylor to do her whole heroic cafeteria exit. I'm going to call this one correct. I guess like, I think we basically know that Dinah's plan for Taylor was always more complicated than just get arrested in the cafeteria. At least I think, yeah, um, I, I I think it's I think maybe she didn't know exactly what would happen, like she said, but she yeah she she knew that it she knew that she was probably misleading the heroes a little bit. I think that's probably true. Yeah, yeah. As for new ones, I, I'm finding it's getting harder and harder to do these as we move deeper and deeper into the story. I think we're in the back third of the story now, so we're starting to get the resolution of things rather than the explicit setup of things. So it's harder for me to do stuff. But I still got one for you, Matt. Um, here's my people have been asking. I've been talking about that people are going to escape from the, the birdcage for a while now. And everyone is always like, how are they going to do it? And my answer is, I don't know. I just think narratively it's going to happen. Um, I finally have a guess, I guess, now. Okay. Um, I think Saint is going to uh, expose Dragon's true nature as a robot, as an AI. And I think that will damage her reputation enough in the world that the things that she has built for the PRT and for the country and for everyone uh, will become tainted. And part of that will be we have to uh, transition people from that kind of technology. And part of that will be the birdcage. So they're going to let some people out or at least move them to other prisons in which they will escape from <laughs> because it's not a <laughs> birdcage. So that's my All right. Guess. Cool. I see Saint as becoming a, a uh, antagonist here pretty quickly, especially now that... Taylor has seemingly um, sided with Dragon. Um, it just seems like naturally what's going to happen. Yeah, and I think this is the first time we've seen his face. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. All right, Scott. 
that will wrap up our coverage of Arc 22 Cell. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback and we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. Yeah, uh, you can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. Uh, my personal Twitter is at scottdale85 and Matt's is at more denim. He's sick. Yeah, I am. Uh, if, <laughs> if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. Tomorrow, we will be dropping another episode of So-Called Writers, the 45-minute show where Matt and Michael write a 30-minute short story and then talk about it and talk about what they learned. It's such a great show. I love it so much. Thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of fun with that. And and please uh, head over to uh, Reddit slash R slash So-Called Writers and uh, write your own contribution for this week's prompt, and we will talk about it. They will. I've, I've heard it. They do that. Yeah, we, uh, we definitely will. At Friday, we will be doing our monthly Book Club live stream at 9.30 Central Time. Join us live on YouTube to discuss The Golden Compass. Yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. Me too. Um, yeah, so if you like any of these many, many shows uh, and you want to support us, we have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash Films. If you like what we do here and you want to help make sure that we keep doing more, consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Special thanks this week to new Planeteer at the $4 level Daniel and new Captain's Planet at the $10 at Tom and upgrading to the $10 level Kifru. Uh, hey. Also, speaking of Patreon, make sure you stop by Wildbo's page and toss some money there because he is the guy that makes this whole thing possible. He is. He is. And if you can't spare any extra cash at the moment, that is absolutely fine. You could like shove uh, We've Got Worm down the throat of some unsuspecting people as if, I don't know, it was like a bunch of bugs or something. Yeah. That's a reference to this arc. It's a joke. Yeah, you, you tell them that it's that that you're you really expect them to enjoy this story. Like, like you're really sure they'll enjoy it. Like with a lot of certainty, like, like a, like an oath or like I don't a know. Curse maybe. Like, a, yeah. Something. Yeah. So, some along <laughs> those lines, you know, you figure it out. Or, or you could just head on over to iTunes and rate and review us. This week's spotlight review comes from Najawi, Najawi, who gives us five stars and says, I spent my whole week looking forward to Worms Day. Listening to Matt and Scott delve into this amazing work of art always puts a smile of childlike glee on my face, as I remember the first time reading. This excellent insight and humor makes us a great listen for worm veterans and newbies alike. Keep up the good work. Matt, literally every time someone says that we're funny, I like rush to my wife and show her the review and like, look, see a human on the internet says I'm funny. You have to admit now that I'm hilarious. And it, uh, it never, never goes well. Yeah, I'm always just surprised. I'm like, when when are we funny? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's it for this week. Next week, we're covering ARC 23 Drone. Again, we'll be recording this episode much earlier relative to when you're hearing it. So we likely won't be addressing many questions and comments next week. But keep them coming regardless. For now, Scott, what is ARC 23 going to be about? Well, Matt, my guess is that Taylor will find herself as kind of the worker bee within the wards. A drone, if you will. And we'll have a, a tough time in this this non-leadership position where she's just one of the underlings, one of the workers, as she struggles to find a place as Weaver in this new world. Her new world, at least. Okay, cool. Well, we will find out if you're right next week on another exciting episode of We've Got Worm. Christ. You okay? <laughs> yeah, the voice. Is it, is it doing okay? Every part of my head. <laughs> <laughs> you sound pretty sick over there, Matt. Yeah, doing I mean, okay? I was wondering toward the end, I'm like, is this even going to be, is this audio quality going to be usable? Because my voice is just like. I think you're fine.